So yeah, I think we can start. So hello everyone. Welcome to the test of general relativity parallel session. As Megan said, I'm Gregorio Carullo. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Innsbruck Institute in Copenhagen, and I'm going to chair this session. So the format of the talks is 15 minutes plus five minutes of questions. If you're a speaker, I will send you a message to remind you when you have two minutes left. If a talk goes over time, the question time will be reduced proportionally, but we strongly encourage to leave all the allotted time for questions. So we have four talks scheduled in total for this session, and we will have a 10 minutes break after the first two talks. So one of the speakers at withdraw, so we have 20 minutes uh, at the end of the session, which are empty, and hopefully we can use those to discuss further questions that people might have. Uh, we encourage questions at the end of each talk. The chat is enabled for this parallel session, but questions should be asked through the Q&A feature. If you want to explicitly unmute to ask your questions, just write your, nor your question normally in the Q&A box. If you do not want to speak, note that in the Q&A message or post them on news. And yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say. So now to our uh, first speaker, which is Pierre Mourier from the University of Balearic Islands, who is gonna discuss Overton's and Black Hole Spectroscopy, both uh, in the gravitational wave emission and in the horizon dynamics. Please take it away, Pierre. Thank you, and thanks for the organizer for giving me the opportunity of presenting this work that I've uh, done in collaboration with Shisko Jimenez Forteza, Daniel Pukob, Truf Sharma, Chuye, Barry Krishnan, and Eric Schneider. And so, indeed, I will tell you about the use of overtones for black hole spectroscopy uh, for the early, early ring down regime, both in the electro gravitational wave emission and in the dynamics of the horizon. So, I will start with a quick introduction of quasinamer modes and overtones for black hole spectroscopy. And then I will present our results for the two aspects, so the modeling the apparent horizon dynamics and uh, the actual ring down waveform at infinity and their parameter recovery. In both cases, uh, both in terms of quasi normal mode models and some alternatives that I will present. Uh, so as we all know, we are now in an era where we routinely observe gravitational waves from compact binary mergers, especially with a majority from binary black hole mergers. And uh, there are multiple applications running from constraints on cosmology or stellar astrophysics to what we are uh, interested in here in, in this session that are tests of uh, gravity and general relativity. Here I will be uh, talking specifically about the use of the ring down, which is the last phase of uh, gravitational emissions, the damped oscillations for this uh, test of gravity. So this uh, damped regime is uh, can be described at late enough times as linear perturbations around the final black hole, uh, as a discrete set of eigen modes, which are the quasi-normal modes of, of the final black hole. So for a given perturbation field, where, let's say for instance the gravitational wave strain as a tensor mode, we can uh, decompose it for its angular dependence in spin-weighted spheroidal harmonics, and for each of these uh, angular components, it can then be written as a sum of uh, quasi normal modes that are labeled by an additional index n that labels either the fundamental modes for n equals zero or overtones that are damped faster. The black hole uniqueness on our theorem in general relativity tells us that axisymmetric, asymptotically flat, and smooth vacuum space time are characterized just by the mass, angular momentum, and charge. And of course, in an astrophysical context, we'll just assume that this electromagnetic charge is zero. So we end up with just these two parameters and uh, the care solution, or its partial limit. So the quasi normal mode frequencies themselves should also be just parameterized by these two quantities. Oops, sorry, these two quantities. And the, um, the dependence in the mass is trivial, and the dependence in the spin can be, uh, well, the, the values can be computed numerically as a function of the spin or just tabulated. The so black hole spectroscopy then consists in uh, testing this prediction of general relativity from the ring down alone by measuring frequency and damping time for at least two ring down modes, or at least three of these four parameters, and then check their consistency with a single uh, pair of mass and spin values. This is a theory. In practice, black hole spectroscopy is challenging, especially because we don't know for sure when is this linear or quasi normal mode description really valid. Because the signal is damping, it's safer to use this approximation at a later time, but it's also getting weaker. This is especially an issue for the overtones, which are much faster, than, much faster damped than the fundamental mode and thus uh, quickly suppressed from the signal. It's in this respect that there was some interest and debate around this paper by Gisela et al. from a few years ago, 
that was suggesting that using a large enough number of overtones, you can model already from early times near the merger, so for louder with a loud enough signal, uh, the, the, the entire ring down just with quasi number modes. So we were especially interested in uh, discussing further if such a thing really could be um, useful enough to be applicable for spectroscopy and if it really was a, a robust uh, claim. In particular, to test the robustness, we wanted to check if such a quasi-normal description would also be valid near the source in a different regime that corresponded to the deformation of the uh, actual apparent horizon that's formed in, a, uh, in our case, in a head-on collision of uh, non-spinning black holes. So we used a high, high precision simulation result from Pukor et al. Uh, of, of such a simulation, where the axis symmetry of the problem lets us consider up to many harmonics uh, with a low numerical error. And uh, we used uh, n equal mass uh, black holes in this case. The uh, actual quantity we looked at is the shear of the uh, outgoing null rays on the horizon. So that can be decomposed in spin weighted spherical harmonics in this case. And that defines the shear modes that are just here only labeled by the, uh, spherical, in by the spher spherical harmonic index L. This, the, this, this quantity monitors the area evolution of the horizon along with another vector contribution. And thus it quantifies the infalling gravitational radiation. As the gravitational radiation being, is emitted somewhere around the photon sphere, we expect this to be also connected to the outgoing gravitational radiation and to the quasi normal modes of the random black hole. And indeed, if we look at these uh, modes as a function of time here in load scale, we recover at uh, late times uh, damped oscillations, which we sh uh, show that for all the modes, we are indeed very well described by the fundamental uh, quasi normal modes of the final black hole, which is the Schwarzschild black hole in this case. Uh, be, be, beyond that, if we look at earlier times, the, uh, the, the behavior is quite different, and we see a steep um, non-oscillating damping, which we also want to investigate and see if we can describe the entire um, time dependency of the, of, the, of the shear modes. So for that, we consider a model which include uh, overtones in addition. So we consider an arbitrary, uh, uh, any, any number of overtones, uh, given, any given number of overtones in the model, where the uh, frequencies and damping times are given by the GR values and the amplitude and phases have to be uh, fit for. And then we, com we compared uh, the mismatch of this model to, the, to, to each of the shear modes. Uh, for, for most of the modes, we can see an improvement of the match uh, as expected as we go to, uh, at we, as we start uh, looking at the shear modes on, uh, at later and later times, so deeper into the linear regime. We also see that uh, for all of these modes, we get an improvement of the match as we add more and more tones to the model up to some uh, L-dependent optimal value where the improvement becomes more marginal. And we can get a very good match even at early times for, for some modes, provided we use a very, up to very high number of overtones. We can also visualize that directly on the, on the shear mode when we start the fitting at some early time uh, in, still, into the, still in the, inside the um, steep early time decay regime. And we see as we add more and more overtones here from two to seven that it recovers the entire, sorry, the entire behavior quite well, even at times before uh, we start constraining the fit. These early times are very are still highly dynamical and should be in the nonlinear regime, or we expect so. And in fact, we even know that the times immediately after the horizon formation cannot be strictly described by a finite sum of modes because they have an they show an infinite slope at the formation of the horizon. Yet, if we discard the very uh, short time immediately after horizon formation, we saw that the shear modes and also the multiple moments of the horizon that I didn't show are well described by a combination of quasi normal modes up to possibly using a large number of overtones. So, are we really seeing large? Are we really seeing that quasi normal modes are present at nearly all times with, an, with a surprising uh, early start of the linear regime, or are, are they just behaving as a merely convenient uh, function basis? We tried a few approaches to, to, to answer that. Uh, first of which was to consider the stability of the amplitudes of the recovered modes as we uh, change the start of the, of, the, of, the, of the the starting time of the fit. Uh, here's the example of the L equals two mode for what's around the optimal number of three or four overtones. We saw that the amplitudes of the fundamental mode is recovered in an extremely stable way at all times, but that's not at all the case for all the other modes. Uh, there is only some short stability region here for three, for up to three overtones in the, well, in the interesting uh, 
non, when we when we start uh, fitting from an early times, and then at, at later times or for a larger number of tones, uh, this is definitely overfitting. Another thing we can do is to compare uh, this um, modeling to models that have an identical number of free parameters but deviate from uh, such linearized DR. Uh, for instance, one can just try to let the frequency and damping time of the last tone be free, and we found that that typically um, show no particular preference one way or another with respect to um, just quasi number modes with fixed DR frequencies at the same number of uh, free parameters. And the other approach, which we uh, have been doing in collaboration with uh, Drew Sharma, is uh, to just use some alternative phenomenological models designed to encompass the strong early time damping in some effective effective, uh, effective term encompassing the nonlinear effects, which can be, for instance, uh, just a power law or an, exponent, an additional exp non oscillating exponential decay. And we compare them uh, between each other and with respect to this reference overtone model in terms of a Bayesian, a relative Bayesian information criteria. We saw that uh, for at least all the subdominant harmonics, so beyond L equals two, all of these candidate models that effectively include some nonlinear features can in principle provide a better description than the overtone models. And I refer you also as well to, uh, to a slightly later paper uh, by Chen et al which discussed also the modeling of horizon uh, in by quasi number modes, but in the case of an I call quasi circular binary black hole mergers for I call masses and a few, the first few harmonics. As a next step, we went back to the uh, actual waveform, as you can see it as null, in, as you can observe it as null infinity, and we wanted to consider up to much larger numbers of our tones than before to see if the trend of improvement of the modeling would continue, if we could define an optimal number of tones and so on. And uh, in this case, we focus just on the dominant two to uh, mode of the strain. The first step was to compute uh, frequency tables for one of the, for, for a special ZN equals eight uh, quasi normal modes that has multiple branches uh, and, uh, and an unstable limit. Uh, that was discussed a bit in the literature, but we couldn't actual, find actual uh, values for it. We then used a, a few hundred waveforms from numerical relativity simulations that we took from the SXS catalog, covering a range of mass ratios and uh, line spins in our case. And we described each of these uh, waveforms from a given time in terms again of uh, sum of quasi normal modes with a variable number of uh, overtones. In this case, the frequency and damping times were still computed from the GR value, but the, they were computed from a mass and spin values that were left uh, free and to be recovered. And then we measured uh, the bias uh, on these uh, recovered values of the remnant mass and spin compared to the true value from the from the simulation by considering the strain uh, from from its from its uh, peak of the peak of the two two model. What we saw as the um, you can see here from the uh, as the median value of the bias for all of the waveforms we considered. As a function of the number of tones, we saw a typical improvement of of the of this bias with the number of of tones, until typically the, the numerical error is reached. Although that optimal value of the number of tones can depend and, and be much larger depending on the individual waveform. So again, that lets us wonder whether these overtones should are actually physically present in the signal. We tried, for instance, to change the starting time. So by starting at later times, we recover the same trend, although as expected, you need not as many overtones to, to, to reach an optimum. Uh, more surprisingly, perhaps, we obtained that we, we got that this same trend is also visible uh, with, if you start sometime before um, the, the, the merger. So a priori still within the inspiral regime, which makes it rather suspicious that just a sum of overtone is supposed to cover uh, the, the, the whole physics there. The other, um, another, another um, attempt that we did was similarly to before trying to look, looking at the stability of the recovery of amplitudes of individual modes. Uh, in this case, by checking how much the what the relative variation of the amplitude of a given tone between uh, when we add one more tone to the model, and within models that have a large enough number of tones, the fundamental mode, or for even larger number of tones, the, fun, the first overtone have a decent stability uh, below one percent, but all the other modes seem to be uh, very unstable, and so that suggests, in terms of uh, future spectroscopy. Uh, 
purposes that uh, this would be rather challenging because you would have to let the frequency and damping time of the tones also be free and somehow expect to still recover them in a, in a stable way. And that is also in a zero noise signals here. And, uh, there was, and, and uh, later, this, this recent paper by Beba Fetal also uh, confirmed with even stronger arguments the, um, the, the, that um, uh, suggested with even stronger arguments that the, these uh, some of overtones may be indeed just doing overfitting. And it also confirmed the hypothesis that we made, specific, especially based on this curve here, that the better recovery of the final parameters of, of the final black hole was mostly improving due to a better fit of the fundamental mode only at late times, while the rest of the model was capturing the, the early times somewhat artificially. And uh, the last thing we, we tried in this model was to, that we did in collaboration with Chuyi, who is a PhD student at uh, Penn State University now, was to look at one example waveform uh, from the success catalog. Uh, we, we took one that's compatible with the parameters of the first detected event. And Recovering the, the the parameters of each model uh, in a, with nested sampling in uh, while injecting the numerical signal in an arbitrary constant noise. So we, we could do that with, for instance, SNR hundred because this way we can clearly see the, the remaining bias. We compare it. We compared it with the overtone models, for instance, to um, uh, phenomenological models that include some nonlinearities in the time dependence of the model with an effectively um, time dependent frequency at uh, especially at early times and uh, it, it has a similar bias in a different direction than the overton models that has the same number of parameters and we also uh, tried we also considered an, an inspire measure ring down model from the phenom d class cut off to only keep the, the ring down part starting at the peak of course which in this case is parameterized by the initial by the initial uh, black hole's parameters, from which we extract the final uh, mass and spin, and also has a phase parameter. Uh, and in this case, the, the fundamental mode only uh, the fundamental mode only model was uh, has the same number of free parameters and is performing very poorly. While well, you need to increase more the number of overtones under the parameters of the model to to better recover. The, to, to recover the, 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 the final parameters as good as the phenom D model can do. So these are some examples of models that one way or another uh, include some uh, nonlinear features and that can do a lot better or at least as good as a sum of quasi number models only. And I'll point you as well to this uh, recent, some more, so the more recent papers that have all uh, independently obtained some evidence for some nonlinearities in the specific form of second order perturbation modes in uh, numerical um, waveforms, though in this case, these were only features in uh, higher harmonics in the four formal in particular. And I think, oops, I think I'm over time, so I will leave you with this conclusion slide. I will just quickly mention some of the future prospects. So we aim in particular at looking at uh, prospects for distinguishes such as the linear quasi model from such uh, um, alternative proposals. Uh, for realistic signals, like in presence, uh, so in presence of noise, and how this could possibly be applied for spectroscopic purposes, it would definitely be worth focusing more on uh, um, spectroscopy using higher harmonics, which are, already has a potential application to current detectors. And finally, we'd like to look more in depth into the fundamental reasons for the presence or more reliable proof of the absence of photons in early time regimes, for instance, by uh, considering simulations to look at the um, uh, non-perturbative deformations of, uh, of space-time around the horizon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre. Yeah, this was quite interesting. And, you know, it's clear it's, it's the result of very hard computations that took a lot of effort. So kudos to that. Uh, I don't see any question in the Q&A or in the chat would somebody want to ask a question okay maybe i can uh, start with one so there are some papers from Niv kira and abayashtekar where they show that um, using the bms uh, formalis you can actually so the well it's what you said right the waveform at the horizon and the waveform at infinity are not independent so in principle if we are in the, especially if you are in the linear regime given one you could predict the other of course, this is easier said than done. For Svashil, it might be doable. For Kerr, it's quite difficult. So do you have any 
uh, insights on that? What are your what are the prospects? Do you think? Well, yeah, we did, we we looked a bit at that for for Schwarzschild and and for Kerr, it's a lot more challenging. We we really made use of the accessibility of the problem in this case. There are already some. I mean, this the study by Chenetta that I briefly mentioned went a little bit around that already by by actually considering a, a care final state, right? Because it was a quasi circular in spiral. So, but we what we saw was indeed that. So very late times behave exactly the same way. So exactly like you expect in terms of uh, quasi normal modes. I uh, what I'm not sure we completely understand is why the early time behavior is a radically different behavior. Like both of them can be captured by some of quasi normal modes, probably artificially. But the in the horizon case, you have a strong damping before the late time oscillations, and in the in the waveforms, you have an increase in amplitude during the spiral and then only a decrease during the ring down. Um, and we, yeah, we, we don't, for now, we don't exactly understand that. But I mean, that, that's one of the things we'll certainly investigate if we look at the at the uh, perturbation near, uh, around the horizon, which will then be generating the, the, the radiation on both, both ways. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we are a bit over time. So we can go on to the next speaker, and then if there are other questions, we will have 20 minutes at the end of the session to discuss further in this. Uh, so thanks again, Pierre. So I Thank think you, you can stop sure. sharing your screen. Yeah. And okay. the next speaker is Nathan Johnson McDaniel from the University of Mississippi, who is going to present the results of the LIGO Vigo Kagra Testing General Relativity Group Mock Data Challenge. So Nathan, you can share your screen. Thank you. So I will not uh, show my video because my internet connection is literally been a bit unstable. So I hope uh, I won't drop out suddenly. So yes, it's a, oops, a pleasure to talk to you today on behalf of the Kakra uh, Tetanjok uh, group to tell us about what we've been doing and prepare for our O4 analyses with our mock data challenge. So kind of just to start motivating things, as I think most people in the session are aware, there's now a pretty large set of GR that get run on all the other case sections, or at least on the Cold Open test. If you want to see the latest results, look at this particular archive paper. So far, we're not testing any specific theory. We're doing everything from signal consistency to looking at parameterized deviations in various parts of the, the signal, from the signal itself to propagation effects, looking at the ring down, echoes, pulsing tests, and more and we'll keep proposing more and more tests to run. So we want to understand the relation between all these tests, in particular, understand how you they're affected by waveform systematics, how they respond to some potential deviation so off. We've got lots and lots of these, but uh, we'll look at a few that I'll discuss later. And in particular, how they will be affected by glitches and which is also from glitch mitigation. So we have three modified challenges to cover these three topics, and I'll discuss them in a moment. So first, go to the overview of the MDCs. So we have one that looks at the systematics. Here, these are geoinjections with no noise, and we're using wake models, not using the analyses. So the main ones are things like 5914 and 76.8 signals with uh, this TOPUSMS Chiato wave ones. So it's not quite the most recent one, but the one that we, was the most recent when we started this. So the effect of one body. The uh, model, but it's not one used in the analyses. And these are both aligned spin processing cases for each of these, but with small spin spectres around point one. And if you're curious, we can discuss the exact parameters later, but I don't think they're that important for my show. And these are the basis for the other two MDCs. So we're looking at forecasts over sensitivity, so it's only better than the sensitivity we're looking currently for the LIGO book network. So these are SFRs around 40 for the 15 case and 30 for the 10 years case. And we also will consider some processing success in our BDH waveforms, but I'm not going to show anything these for these. In fact, I'm not going to show anything with certain these are cases. Um, though we do have some results here. So, and I want to thank Craig Pratton for help setting up this MBC. So going to the non geo MBC, these are also at the doors, but here non geo objections, again based on TB with some else. And here the idea is that we're not trying to emulate some specific alternative theory. But we want to introduce the geodivisions divisions. We're interested in testing some controlled way. So we also don't want to use the same things being used as a specific test, except for one 
uh, except in what is the massive craft on the spread. So here, this is, you know, we want to include a propagation effect. This is a very standard one. You this is how it's exactly tested. We said, yeah, we'll include this. So that's one thing that we look at. The other ones are ones we actually modify the energy and angular momentum flux of the EOP model itself. So here, this is kind of an updated version of something that was used to test one of the tests earlier, where we take some of the modes of the, the waveform here, the three plus one, two, and four plus one, four modes. These both first iterate two pn in the in spiral and multiply that by a constant factor. So the modification starts at two pn, but you get also modifications like three pn, three pn, five pn, etc. You also set the final atom spin several consistently to satisfy inclined momentum balance. You kind of modify the entire waveform this way. So we have two versions: one in which you multiply the modes of the waveform by the same factor, and one they say, you know, this is it is locked as a field that's coupled by two more factors. So the other thing we do to modify the actual waveforms themselves is to modify the quantum mode spectrum. So this uses the quantum quantum mode spectrum to kind of give some um, rationale for why we had to do this specific particular we do, so we just do some final uh, charge for the black hole and say we modify the the uh, question is this way. We, of course, would expect any case like this to also have modifications in spiral, but it's possible there could be some case where you get only modifications very, very close to the merger, and that's kind of what we're thinking of here. And besides, it's generally it's not supposed to do in the political kind of theory. Again, we set this final up and bend self consistently. We also have scale tensor polarizations. So we add a scale polarization just by multiplying the modes of the tensor waveform by the expectation for scale tensor theory. Again, you expect modification the phasing here. We again, we don't include these just to kind of separate the shift effects. And finally, we scale some binary neutral subwaveforms here, the width of TAP with MS, with tides, of course, and BAM macroality simulations to binary black hole like total masses to emulate binary black hole metrics. So, finally, the glitch BC, this is the only one with noise. So, here, uh, Jack Walk did lots of amazing work to set this up, finding all these glitches in O3. We colored things to the forecast of sensitivity for the light detectors, and then just due to not be able to find glitches easily in Virgo, Virgo just Gaussian noise, and then sticking what are the processing for the for the like cyclic waveforms on top of the glitch. And then the thing is we just get into glitches, you know, for those of you who know the things scale light, blip, time day, these sorts of things. And you stick it to mark the like in the end spiral in the world near the wing down. And so I started to think Rico had taken over from Jack when Jack went on to do both the in Cambridge. So a quick overview, I'm not going to go listen to the TL they deserve, but a quick overview of the test currently discontinuing. So for those of you who are not completely familiar with all of these, I'll just sort of remind you of what I'm going to be showing in the next slide. So this isolated motor consistency test with the initial wing down consistency test. Checks consistency of the low high frequency positive signals, so the in spiral and motor ring down, and this boosting the final and spin computed from the now fits to the analyses from each part waveform. This new subnormal multiple you know, amplitudes or SMA test just looks at consistency of some of multiple amplitudes. They have the amplitude to expect in GR, the swing disk quadruple moment test, or it's again, it's a null test that looks at a specific combination of the swing disk quadruple moments, typically the uh, symmetric one and check the consistent with the values of black holes. MDR looks at modified dispersion relation. Uh, Fahrenheit's SAB or PSAB looks at division swing down frequencies, but it analyzed the entire waveform. And then finally, the kind of two big parameter tests, TIGO and FTI, testing trick and children 38 fixed off the independent, constrained deviation waveform phase, and partition coefficients, and so if it's a partition coefficient parameters because of how they are constructed. So Tiger, if you for your modified by some coefficient, it also lets the modification extend into the post post in spiral. And also Tiger has lots of modifications this post in spiral coefficients. So we'll get a new version based on from XP. And then FTI just goes to PN coefficients and tapers things away. So but it's now been extended to it goes all the way to the peak of the waveform. And of course, way more tasks will get to the final version of MDC, which is the one that we'll be showing you in the next few slides. So we get on to let's get a sample, the kind of these results. So there's just 59 14 like once a moment in digits of time. So here on the systematics in these results. So this is 59 14 like a line spin at the top and processing at the bottom. So 
they're going to just to give you an overview of how to read these plots. So what I'm plotting is the deviation from GR expressing chaos in sigmas on the vertical axis, and then the different tests are all given on the horizontal axis, the dark black bars separate different tests, and the lighter gray bars separate different parts of the test. For instance, let's look at Tiger first. So there's going from minus 1 pn up to 3 5 pn for the nth power all coefficients, then these b uh, intermediate coefficients, then finally the c metamaintain coefficients. And you see that there's about 90% credibility in terms of cast and sigma here. These are all consistent with the GR. Then you know, really, we don't get an exact consistency, and it gets worse as you get higher pn orders, as you would expect. I mean, there is some waveform mismatch here. According to FTI, we have the same in, uh, pn coefficients, and then we have a new FTI version of the spin this quadrant moment, which is the symmetric kappa uh, term here as well. Again, we just look at, even though these are injections are including in higher modes, if you just lose the uh, dominant mode FTI, then actually things are fine. If you use the high mode FTI, then actually things are not fine, even though the two wafer models themselves agree well. So this is TOPUs and S. And it's maybe for Agent Rom, have actually misfitted less than four and minus three uh, for both uh, airlines been possessing. So, spin is quantum moment. This is simply using an old Fadam PV2 version, but it's you know, fine. My first spin relation, the basic A equals alpha equals zero case, this one includes the um, as a graviton dispersion, as the, the positive one is fine, but for the higher. Uh, alphas, so these are higher powers of uh, momentum in the Schrodinger relation. These are not looking at all. You're carefully getting things that are uh, looking like a very strong jet deviation. So it turns out that here, if you look at just the dominant mode, and the outside is the dominant mode define here. So there's, even though we're getting a very small mismatch between the two wave models, we have to get a really large systematic error. So this is going to be quite worried about, in fact. And for the PSCB, also it's fine. So in the case, we have fewer results, but we do have the RMR consistency test, which is also fine. Left, it's been set down multiple alternatives, also looking fine. FTI here, again, just the current web looking fine. And in, in DR, it's also getting a bit less good for even uh, alpha equals zero, but PSB is still fine, even though it's also using just a uh, line spin away from one. So going on to some of the um geo wave on, so first the mass of graviton wave on. So this is quite a very large graviton mass of 2.6 times to the minus 22 EV. Oops, I think that's a typo. It should be just EV plus E squared, not EV squared plus E squared. Um, so this is about 20 times the constraint from alternate events to date. Uh, and this was chosen just so we had a specific deviation on many tests. And the constraints from many all the events to date from combining things together. So you won't see these as a deviation in uh, total cases. Of course, we don't exactly see this in the data, but this is just to check how the uh, tests respond to it. And here you see that, for instance, you get a um, three sigma deviation five with CT. Uh, the in spiral parameter for Tiger dot seen very large deviations, maybe somewhat large for oh, minus 1 pm. But then when you get to the major way down, the C coefficient to the also the three FTI, also just because of how it deals with these. Deviations differently, it sees actually quite a large deviation in the 1 pn coefficient, as you can see below, and these, uh, what the, the uh, story is that it actually is covering the actual value pretty well, as you'd expect, because this is just a single pn, effective pn deviation to the end spiral, and it's going, covering most of the end spiral now. But Tiger, of course, covers things actually quite close to Joe and does not get this, as you'd expect, and these are designed to actually pick up the uh, uh, true values of the PN deviations. Of course, we do see that SQM and PSCB also pick up pretty strong deviations. Going on to the modified energy flux case, here have a no waveform ceiling. So we're assuming that we've had a fairly large deviation, so a factor of 10 multiple modes. And this is a pretty bizarre dodge if you actually multiply the uh, high mode by that factor. So we say, well, let's assume this is something that's not uh, coupling to a geo detector, so we can actually get a large PN, the 2 pn deviation. So here, Tiger again doesn't see a significant deviation in the uh, slower uh, PN orders or even higher PN orders. 
not only in the intermediate cases, but somewhat of a deviation in these, these uh, between the cases. Surprisingly, so uh, it's the, the cap S case, that's fine, FTI fund size one, but even in the uh, two-pin case, even though, as you can see below, it didn't get exactly the correct value, it's really well over, but it is have a bias look at direction, whereas Tiger is really consistent with zero. And finally, you see that MBR is covering us a nice tier deviation. So finally, I just look at the waveforms, right? You can see that perhaps this could be a difficult one for Tlapod, and you need a shorter waveform, but they do look kind of similar to GR. So looking at the modified QNM spectrum, here we actually get, surprisingly enough, very, very large and certainly much larger sequence we trust with our number of posterior samples uh, cases is with uh, the inspiral coefficients. And whether that it's not the Schwarzenegger, the uh, motoring coefficients, let's see the deviation. We also see inspiral coefficients, large deviations in FTI, and then NDR in large deviations, also PSCP. So we can see the PSCP, it's not getting exactly the change value, which here is shown with a plus, but it's roughly getting not too bad, and it's not it's surprising. So just to show you that the differences away from we have to the linear, that we're getting much higher frequencies and a longer amount of less damning time here. So kind of going rapidly through the main results. So we have here a scale tense case, showing you differences in the amplitude of different detectors. The left, showing that except for India, which is interesting enough, getting a quite high um, tier deviation, we're not really seeing that type of tier deviation, maybe from these higher type of parameters. And then looking for the final non tier case, this is this. Um, Out of scale PS. In this case, this is looking at an equal mass as a hybrid that's been scaled to a three times one times pass, and just plotted by one detector here, and showing that we're getting actually pretty easy to get to as you expect, and this doesn't look at all like a binary black hole waveform in the uh, Platonium. And interestingly enough, it's recovered at a high mass ratio. Okay, so I mean, the big thing, whatever that seems like nitrate 14 could be, so it's not exactly like this because it's highly spinning. Nitrate 14 is not, but still interesting. Finally, just to show you one of the glitch cases. This is a case with a scattered light. So you see this scattered light down here and then the little chip. We see that we do get some deviation, not a really huge one, but at some deviations in, for instance, FTI and glitch indication is still under investigation. So kind of just to summarize, we have this ongoing set of MPCs covering wave and synthetic non-geostic glitches, but it's based in certain way, but the results include significant value to wave and synthetics, even with cases where you have a small bunch of the waveforms, uh, true value of legion to be in division excluded, that even by attacking FDI, and also significant deviations in the inspired type parameters, even just modern and human frequencies. Finally, if you're interested in this sort of thing, there's a talk, we talk later today by Panama, the fact that it's a theater to jar, Sakshi on compared to jar and opting on I'm a test by Colin Tunnels on Friday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, well, thanks, first of all, for condensing so many results. And I think this nicely highlights how these tests are less easy to interpret than one would naively think. So, yeah, I see many applauses. I agree. I don't see any ends up or questions in the Q and A section. In the meantime, maybe I can uh, start. So, maybe I'm naive, but this result about the disagreement between TOB and the models used to recovery, so SOB and IMR phenom, they look pretty puzzling given the low mismatch. So do you have an idea what's happening? Maybe they have a different uh, a different set of higher modes content? So yeah, this is all, I mean, the results shown here are with, or SOB, a different set of higher modes, but we have checked that the main difference is that because the 3 mode is in TBCV, TBS, TBS, and not in SCBA, 
and all and that's not the problem I mean, you get a, if you don't include the higher mode in the the theta mode of the ejection you get a slight shift towards the uh TMA, but it's still a space large difference so this is still under investigation and the case with the uh high mathematics PhD is also very confusing because as I said, for the higher alpha values, you get good results if you just don't include how much all, but then somehow the alpha equals zero case gets biased. So this is still to be investigated. Thank you very much. So I don't see other questions for Nathan. Then I guess we can uh, go for a break, which is scheduled for scheduled for 10 minutes. And then if people have questions in this, uh, we can discuss them at the end of the session at 5.30. So thanks all and meet you here in 10 minutes. Okay, I guess we can start. So welcome back everyone to the test of general relativity session. Now we're gonna have a talk from Johannes Nuller from uh, the, the University of Portsmouth. And the title of the talk would be Probing the Speed of Gravity with Lisa, like Virgo Kagra, and, jo and Joint Observations. Please take it away. Great. Thanks, Gregorio. Thank you all for being here and for having me. Um, so as Gregorio just told you, I'll be telling you about testing the speed of gravity. Uh, and I want to start with some credits because this is somewhat related to what Nathan was just talking about uh, and some, some work that has been going on for a long while uh, in the testing GI group. Uh, so I want to just... How oh, can I change the slides? Oh. Um, so I just want to highlight straight away that the work I'll be talking about today here uh, is work with Ian Harry, a colleague of mine uh, at Portsmouth, but there's some related work going on in the testing GR group as well uh, that we're doing partially inspired by this work, partially independent with uh, Tomek Harris and Balish down there, which I won't be talking about today, uh, but just to highlight that that's going on. Okay, so uh, let me start by spending a bit of time setting the scene. Um, and I want to start in a, in a somewhat unlikely place by starting uh, to talk about just normal electromagnetism and normal optics. And particularly here, you see one of these standard uh, prism pictures where you have light being uh, refracted and splitting out the different wavelengths. And of course, historically, this is something that played a big role in understanding the wave-like nature of light itself. But later on, this was, uh, uh, of course, reverse engineered. Uh, and you can use these kind of experiments to learn more about the, the structure that the light is actually passing through, to learn about its refractive index, its transparency, and about its structural properties. And so the, the sort of key idea behind what I will tell you about now is to use gravitational waves in the same sense. Now we have gravitational waves. We see these sources that are uh, cosmological distances away from us, tens to thousands of megaparsecs. That gravitational wave travels to us. And it also travels to us through a medium. That medium now is the particle content of the universe. And so by, by looking at these gravitational waves, looking at propagation effects that can affect uh, the gravitational wave as it's passing through this medium, we can now start to learn something about this intervening medium about the particle content of the universe. And thankfully, we have some idea about what that, what that medium is. Uh, so here is the, the standard cosmic pie chart that you get, for example, from the Planck 18 data. And the thing that immediately jumps out at you is that the, the majority of the energy density in the universe, the majority of this contribution to this pie chart is given by dark energy. So a very natural uh, uh, thing to look for uh, when you now look for these propagation effects is to see whether you can actually try to zoom in on the nature of dark energy, try to learn something about it and constrain it further by looking at gravitational waves and their propagation. So that's the basic setup that we're looking into here. Very good. So you may tell me, well, I'm talking about the speed of gravity, but we already know what that is. We have a fantastic observation from GW170817, the binary neutron star merger. And what I want to highlight here is, of course, that this is a measurement that was done in the LVK band uh, around here. Uh, and so if, you, uh, if you're dealing with a situation where the speed of gravitational waves is just a constant number, then of course you're done. You've done this measurement uh, and then you can go home. Uh, but in particular, in cases where there's any kind of energy dependence, scale dependence, or equivalently frequency dependence, that's not necessarily the case. And you can be uh, in, in setups where even though the speed of gravitational waves in the LIGO Virgo Kagura band up here is extremely close to unity, extremely close to the speed of light, this may not be the case 
as we go away from that band, for example, over into the Lisa band. And so I want to spend a little bit of time giving you a feel of why it's, uh, it's natural and to be expected in some theories that there is some such frequency dependent transition. And this is not just some sort of oddity that we can look out for, but something that's very well motivated. And in order to do that, I, I again want to take you out of the gravitational wave comfort zone a little bit and talk a bit more uh, in terms of particle physics. In particular, I want to take you to the 1930s, uh, Enrico Fermi's laboratory in, uh, in Rome. Uh, and what they were looking at at the time, something they tried to understand, was neutron decay. But you had a neutron splitting up into a proton and an electron, uh, and the experimental data were, were somewhat odd. They seemed to be missing momentum. And of course, we know what, uh, what the answer is in hindsight now. And the explanation was, uh, was something that they really uh, framed at the time. It is now known as Fermi theory, which is really the introduction of the neutrino or anti-neutrino here that tells you that you can now formulate and understand this decay process here. Now, if you have this new fantastic theory, this Fermi theory, of course, something you'd like to do is calculate things with it. One of the first things you'd like to calculate are scattering amplitudes. Scattering amplitudes are, are really just a formal way of asking the question, what is the, the likelihood of this decay to occur? With what probability does this decay occur that the neutron comes in and starts splitting up? And so you can work this out and you can find that the scattering amplitude, this probability for that decay, scales in the way that I've written down here. Scales is the energy of the process divided by a particular scale, which sits around a tera electron volt, a TeV, to some power, which is not important for our purposes here. And so the, the key observation here is that this should be somewhat alarming to you just as an expression already, because this is meant to be something that you can treat as a probability. And so this should be between zero and one. And something that you can see very clearly is that as the energy of the process grows, eventually this doesn't really know any bound. It will certainly go uh, uh, above one. And so you, this ceases to be interpretable as a probability. So you know something goes off with the theory as you approach a tera electron volt as a scale. Now, in hindsight, of course, we know what goes wrong. We know this is not the full description. We know that underneath all of this, there's electroweak theory, which means that the picture on the left is not complete. And as you get to energies close to a tera electron volt, in fact, around 80 giga electron volts, so about an order of magnitude less than a tera electron volt, this description breaks down and needs to be replaced by some new physics, this electroweak theory, some, some new description of the process. And so this is essentially telling you that you could diagnose in the original theory at what scale it was going to break down and new physics was about to kick in. And so this was something that you could already tell without knowing anything about the electroweak ultraviolet completion, just diagnosing at the level of the original theory. Now, why am I telling you this? Why am I spending so much time on talking about Fermi theory here? Because this is precisely analogous to a calculation we can do, for example, in general relativity. Here, if we look at the scattering of two gravitons, two uh, fluctuations, I guess, in the, in the gravitational field, we can find that this starts diverging at around 10 to the 15 tera electron volt, or express the more familiar form as we approach the Planck mass. And so this is really the particle physics version of this statement that we know that general relativity at the very latest breaks down as we approach the Planck mass. Energy is comparable to the Planck mass. And now finally, in large classes of dark energy theories, you can again do a similar calculation. These are theories where, for example, not necessarily, but for example, dark energy is described by a dynamical scalar field. Again, you can scatter the scalar field of each other, repeat the same calculation. And you find that this theory already breaks down at around 10 to the minus 12 electron volts, which if you turn this into a distance scale is around 1,000 kilometers or expressed as a frequency scale is around 100 hertz. And so you know that at the very, very latest, these large classes of dark energy theories will break down at around 100 hertz or so, and some new physics needs to come in and needs to kick in. And now I'll finally take you back to the, uh, to the picture that I was sort of starting to uh, motivate at the outset. What that is really telling you is that the whatever, whatever dark energy theory that may or may not affect the speed of gravitational waves lives uh, at low frequencies, if you think in terms of frequency space, around 10 to the minus 18 hertz is cosmological scales. As we go to higher frequencies, we probe smaller and smaller distance scales. And so at the very, very, very best, these kind of theories can push up to maybe 10 to the 2 hertz or so. But you don't know where on that approach the theory breaks down and new physics comes in. And so from the perspective of these theories, which can affect the speed of gravitational waves and do generically, 
uh, at, at low frequencies, it's not a surprise that what we see in the LVK band is something which is the same as the speed of light. What that's really telling you is that this new physics, the high energy regime, that that's respecting Lorentz invariance. There's no spontaneous breaking of Lorentz invariance there, as far as the gravitational wave is concerned. But that could very well be you actually picking up that there's some transition from a non-luminal speed of gravitational waves back up to a luminal speed due to some new physics. You're just testing this new physics, but you haven't actually really probed the dark energy induced regime where the speed can be different. And so this is a sort of prototypical picture for something that is fairly natural in these kinds of theories, where there's a tail end of this transition, which you may be able to still probe uh, in, the, in the LVK band, some transition which may happen all the way in the Lisa band or here in this illustration uh, in between the Lisa and the LVK band. And then you transition to some asymptote again uh, in the very, very low frequency regime. And so this was first really understood in detail in this paper here. And so the question that we are asking and some others have been asking as well is to really understand how we can use LBK observations and future LISA observations as well as multiband observations to really nail this down and try to hopefully uh, constrain these kinds of transitions. And so uh, along the way also constrain dark energy theories using propagation effects uh, from gravitational waves. So let me tell you a little bit now that I've set the scene and spent most of my time on that, uh, tell you a little bit about the, the, the actual work that we've done here. So first, it's sort of important to, to I guess, parameterize our ignorance about this transition. And so I just want to spend a second on this here. So this is a kind of transition like I was showing you in the previous slide. You can see that it essentially interpolates from some asymptotic low frequency regime where there's a constant non-luminal speed of gravitational waves as you typically get in lots of these dark energy theories, and it interpolates up to, uh, to a regime where you have asymptotically the speed of light. What is our ignorance? Our ignorance is parameterized with three parameters. One, the step size. So to, to what extent is there some non-luminal speed? How big is this deviation from the speed of light? Secondly, at what frequency does this occur? I just spent a lot of time telling you that we know that the largest possible scale where this could happen is at around 100 hertz or so in that uh, order of magnitude. But of course, this could happen below. And as I was showing you in the Fermi theory example, generically in some other examples, it does indeed happen an order of magnitude or two below uh, that, that largest possible expiry date, if you want to think of it like this. So that's the second parameter, the frequency where the transition takes place. Finally, third parameter is the sigma parameter here. That's essentially telling you how steep this transition is. Again, that's something that's a feature of this new high energy physics that we don't know, but that we know needs to kick in in these theories and uh, if it is uh, respecting Lorentz invariance, if it doesn't break spontaneous Lorentz invariance, uh, as far as the gravitational waves are concerned, will give you some, some transition back to the speed of light uh, for the speed of gravitational waves as well. So these are the kind of three parameters uh, that, that we are, I guess, theoretically motivating, but you can really think of these as phenomenological parameters that parameterize what this transition looks like. Very good. So now, conceptually, just to give you the, the sort of key idea up front, the idea is that if we see a single gravitational wave system, of course, this scans through frequency space. We start with an in spiral and the frequency picks up, picks up, picks up as we go towards the merger. And so if the speed of gravitational waves is somehow frequency dependent in the regime that the single system scans, then that will change the way the system, the, sorry, the signal arrives at the observer, at our detectors. And this changes simply because different parts of the signal will travel at different speeds. So the, the waveform as it's emitted is not quite the same as it's received. And just to give you an example of how strong this can be, if you have a source at 400 megaparsecs away or so, even a deviation in the speed of just 10 to the minus nine would shift that part of the signal by over a year compared to having no such deviation. So volume really wins here. And the fact that you travel large distances means that you can really detect tiny deviations uh, in the speed of gravitational waves. So this is kind of the, the main physical rationale behind the, uh, behind the constraints that we are presenting. Very good. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's give you some concrete constraints here. Uh, and so the, the question I guess you can really ask is for, for some given combination of these three parameters here, can you tell this apart, right? If the speed of gravitational waves changes uh, using this template here, when can you really tell that the signal has been affected and it's not as it would be if there was no difference in the speed of gravitational waves? And so technically we can 
uh, we can define a criterion for this so-called distinguishability criterion which is this noise weighted inner product that tells you about is the difference between this modified waveform modified by the effect of the speed of gravitational waves versus the vanilla GR prediction but conceptually you can really just think of this as can we tell this apart with a given detector and so the first plot I'm showing you here is essentially telling you for a transition like so where f star lies here in hertz and we have this, this steepness parameter like so what kind of deviation in the speed of gravitational wave can we tell apart with LIGO Virgo Cagra and here what we're plotting is just for a single event that's GW1708-17 like so one could do better than this uh, with, with stacking different events or using a more optimal event but I'm just showing you this for a single event GW1708-17. Now of course the LVK range is really all the way to the right here but the point is that if that transition is centered around for example 10 to the minus one hertz there's still enough of an effect that can leak over into the LIGO band the LVK band sorry uh, and if you if you see a, even a small tail of this transition there, you can put a constraint uh, on, on a transition that lives at lower frequencies, even all the way down here in the Lisa band as well. And so something that I want to stress is that for, for transitions that are not particularly steep, so where sigma is a, is a small number, so somewhere down here, for example, you can constrain already just with LVK observations, you can constrain these transitions and deviations of the speed of gravitational waves from the speed of light deep 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 all the way into the uh, uh into the lisa band already okay let me move on now we can repeat this sort of analysis and uh, now for a single event considered in the lisa band so this is a forecast for lisa here the event we're considering is a merger of two supermassive black holes about four times ten to the uh, ten to the six four million uh solar masses each uh placed at around oh Excuse me, that's my that's my timer. Probably Gregorio will shout at me in a second as well. Uh, so the place that around one gigaparsec from us. And so again, of course, now you can see we place these extremely strong constraints at uh, 10 to the minus 18 or so uh, in the in the Lisa band as well. So uh, Gregorio, if you if you want to send me a reminder or shout at me at any point, just shout. I don't see the chat. So just so you know. Uh, good. Okay, so let me let me slowly wrap up just before Gregorio starts getting too angry, uh, which is that we can of course uh, put these two together now, a constraint I guess from a single observation uh, in the LVK band and an observation in the Lisa band, and you see that we can place very strong constraints uh, on on all types of transitions except for this kind of region here, which is basically saying steep transitions that are centered in the in the region between the LVK and the Lisa band. So let me wrap up by just telling you about, I'm oh, sorry, I, I forgot about one slide, just to tell you that, of course, if we replace LVK with a next generation detector, like the Einstein telescope, for example, you can see how the constraints improve uh, as the detector sensitivity goes up and we can constrain uh, a, a bigger slice of the parameter space more tightly than we could just with LVK. Now, just to wrap up, what about transitions that live in this region here, i.e. steep transitions that take place uh, conveniently placed within the LVK and, uh, and the Lisa band. For those, the kind of tests that we are considering here, of course, are no good. But what you can do there is use multiband constraints. And so here's the key idea is systems like GW1509-14, which you see for a year or years in the Lisa band already. You can predict when they are meant to enter the LVK band later with an accuracy of around 10 seconds or so. And so the key idea here, of course, is if the speed of gravitational waves changes, at frequencies in between these two bands that will change the arrival time in the LVK band and again you can reverse engineer this to place constraints down to a level of around 10 to the minus 16 to fill in this intermediate band here so that's my uh, my tour de force for the 15 minutes hopefully I, I've convinced you that there's interesting models uh, related to dark energy that do predict these frequency dependent transitions and that we can and, and already know how to constrain these very, very sharply, both with individual or stacking observations in the LVK and LISA band, uh, as well as using multiband techniques for transitions that live in between these different bands. Perfect, thank you. Thank you very much, Johannes. And I, we, uh, so yeah, it, I think these are very urgent connections with theories developed in a, I mean, my cosmological constant context and 
you know, the, the, the argument about uh, this transition is often, I think, unappreciated when people think about those kind of connections. So we still have time for a quick question before moving on to the next talk. Uh, so if you uh, have a question, please raise your hand or write in the Q&A. Yes, Michalis, please. Hi, Johannes. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, I was wondering, so so in the light of the recent um, process timing array discovery, which is, you know, probing the very, very ultra low frequency, uh, much lower than Lisa, it, does this observation or any similar observation in the future, uh, is it able to, to set a cap on this nice picture that you drew where you, know, you have a, an asymptotic behavior for the speed of light of, of gravitational waves that you know may not be the speed of light. I mean, is that is there a way to uh, kind of for for this ultra low frequency observation to say, oh no, you know things would would kind of screw up uh, if uh, gravitational waves didn't propagate at the speed of light like you know we use in our models? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think the one one reason why it's great is that the, if you try to learn about dark energy, the safest place to learn about this is as close as possible to the energy scales and frequencies where dark energy lives, right? So, because this is already conceptually, if you didn't know anything about the pictures I was drawing, uh, a problem with the LBK measurement, you're really measuring something that's 20 orders of magnitude away in frequency or distance scale from cosmological scales. So LISA is better, right? You gain around five orders of magnitude, so it's safer to port constraints from LISA there. Uh, and of course, pulsar timing arrays in that sense are even better uh, from, from that perspective, right? You're now at, at nanohertz regimes, and so you're much closer yet again to the cosmological regime. Um, okay, now, more specifically, if you were able uh, with pulsar timing arrays to pick out an individual localized source at some point in the future, uh, then of course, you can just repeat that the, the same kind of analysis here as well, right? You can do it, and you can do it uh, by bay, and it will give you a, a sort of different anchor point at lower frequencies, and that would be perfect, right? In order to uh, constrain this frequency dependence, ideally what you want is individual points well constrained at different frequencies. So that would be wonderful. In a case where you just have the, the overall background, the quick answer is I don't know. So whether there's, there's some statistical implication that you can really uh, uh, get from just looking at at lowest order background statistics that's imprinted by having a different speed of gravitational waves there. Uh, that's something that I don't know. So, so there I'm going to have to punt. And final thing, the, which is maybe interesting there as well. Uh, so not uh, PTA, but individual binary pulsars, they also play some bounds, albeit weak, on the speed of gravitational waves. So for example, the Hulse-Taylor binary, just from the energy being emitted, uh, you can turn that into a constraint at the level of 10 to the minus two uh, in the deviation of the speed of gravitational waves. So that's already something where you can use pulsar timing arrays there, uh, not directly related to nanographs, but uh, at least to pulsars. So uh, hopefully I've, I've uh, you know, answered at least half of your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? We can have uh, another question now before going to the next talk, I think. So there is one from the Q&A, but I think Johannes can answer that typing. And Arundati, sorry if I mispronounce it, as a question. So please speak up. Yeah. Um, so from the equation on your first slide, it seems that the equation you're solving is valid for only one mode of the gravitational wave. So it's dependent on K the speed dependent term and there's a mass term too uh, which is of the similar form so how would you distinguish between the mass correction and the speed correction and also uh, you know for a generic gravitational wave instead of a monochromatic one uh, i can't see exactly uh, how to distinguish the speed from the mass. Mm, okay, so let me try and answer that. So the, you're absolutely right that I guess everything, I'm, I'm hoping I'm pointing at the right equation, uh, everything that, oh, sorry, 
Um, can't. Never mind. I have, a, I have a dialogue popping up. Hopefully, you can see that. Um, the uh, everything that lives in this term here, everything here affects the the dispersion relation, right? So, by looking at the frequency dependence of the gravitational wave, we can essentially constrain all of this altogether. So, we are effectively constraining different uh, 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 different induced frequency dependencies if uh, we have a mass term here or we have if we have a different k dependence so this is something that we can do right so in the in, in fact we do do already in the testing gr group um we can we can constrain different types of k dependencies here and so the the form of the transition that i was giving you later on is really something that constrains different types of k dependencies all in one so these different powers that were there in the transition they essentially they correspond to different k dependencies all encoded within this here. What is true is that within these dark energy theories, these uh, transitions that go uh, and are, are likely to happen close to the LVK band, these are ones that are higher K corrections. So indeed that's something here, I'm sort of having dual notation in terms of frequency and K, I could write this in terms of K as well. That's really corrections that come in with higher powers of K in these theories rather than just a mass term. But the same techniques work also for a mass term or for some generic K dependence here. And you can constrain that K dependence really like the sigma parameter that I was telling you. Remember there was three parameters, the delta CGW, uh, which was telling you about the step size, uh, the frequency and the sigma. And the sigma was basically encoding what this K dependence is. So by choosing different values, you sort of interpolate between different functions here. I'm not sure I understood your point about the monochromatic. I guess we have a, a gravitational wave field that does go through a signal that does go through different frequencies. Uh, so, so I guess in that sense, it's not monochromatic, but maybe I misunderstood that. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, I was just curious how you would separate the mass correction from the speed correction. Yeah, I, I think that was the question. Mm -hmm. So it's really just that this affects the dispersion relation in different ways, right? So you can really see how the, the, the it's just something you have to model. You can see how the waveform is affected if you have a mass term versus if you have a K squared correction, K to the four correction and so on. I don't have a nice picture to show this to you now, um, but you can see how these things affect the, the dispersion in different ways. They don't disperse the gravitational waves in the same sense. So if you have different K dependencies, they will change the way that your waveform looks in different ways. And also, of course, with the different frequency dependence, right? The mass term will not give you a transition that only happens around uh, the LVK band or only up there as a transition, for example, in these multi-band contexts. So the way it will affect the waveform is going to be visibly different. Okay, thank you. That answers the question. Great, thanks. Thank you both for the discussion. I think it's time to move on to the last talk. The, the next talk is by Paolo Cremonese, he's from the University of the Balearic Islands, and he's going to discuss characteristic features of gravitational wave lensing as a probe lens mass model. Please take it away. Thanks, Gregorio. Uh, hi, everyone. So um, in this talk, I'm going to present you this study on the recognition and characterization of lens event. I left them during my PhD in stretching in Poland and I ultimated here in, in Palma. So our main goals for this study are two. The first one is to distinguish between a lensed and an unlensed event. And the second one is to characterize the lens model properly. So first of all, let me give a quick overview of the lens system we are considering. Here we have a um, supermassive binary black hole as a source of uh, gravitational waves. And this is at the uh, luminosity distance ds from the observer. Then we have a galaxy type of lens at distance dl and dls from the observer and the source. And then we will use a LISA kind of uh, observer as possible observer for this kind of event. Uh, we also have some uh, angles here, which define the position of the source and the position of the image with respect to the direction uh, observer lens. So we choose this configuration in order to have a lens event in uh, the um, wave optics regime. So in fact, the, um, the usual regime 
for the electromagnetic lensing is the one given by the geometrical optics approximation. But in gravitational wave lensing, this approximation can be more easily broken. Here in this slide, we have two equivalent conditions for this uh, to happen. The first one is in terms of the mass of the lens and the frequency of the signal. And the second one, in the second one, we still have the frequency of the signal. And this time we also have the time delay between the images. So what these conditions are saying is that the wave optic uh, kicks in when the wavelength of the signal is comparable to the size of the lens. So I've, uh, I'm going to show a little animation here to see more intuitively what is, uh, what is happening and what this means. So we begin first in uh, a strong lensing that is uh, in the geometrical optics configuration as we have two distinct images of uh, um, gravitational wave event. So here we have the two images. And we can see that uh, the condition now is satisfied for the geometrical optics uh, um, regime since the mass of the lens is larger than this right-hand side factor. Now, if we, um, <clears throat> if we shrink uh, the mass of the lens, the images get closer and closer. Uh, in time and until uh, they interfere with each other at around this point. So here we see that now the mass of the lens is comparable to the right hand side of this uh, first condition. And we have an interference given by the two images. And finally, they form just one image at this point. Uh, and this image is uh, modulated with respect to the unlensed images, let's say. And here we can see that the mass of the lens now is lower, is smaller than the right-hand side here. So the main point here is that um, in the wave optics regime, contrary to the geometrical optics one, uh, the lensing effect imprints a frequency-dependent characteristic feature uh, on the signal. This can be also seen here, where uh, we see how the phase of the amplification factor behaves with the frequency for the cases that I will present in a moment. So the amplification factor is uh, the function by which we multiply the unlensed waveform in the frequency domain to obtain the lensed waveform. Uh, we can see that this function depends on the frequency and on the position of the source, but the main point is that it depends on the frequency. So what we are doing in this study is to exploit this behavior to properly recognize and cate categorize these uh, lens events. For this purpose, we took into consideration different type of lenses and, <clears throat> and we choose their parameters so to have similar mass profiles, as we can see in uh, these plots here, where we have uh, the mass profiles computed for the lens model that we used. The dotted lines show the 3D profile and the solid lines, the 2D one. And we consider two main cases uh, with lenses at redshift 0.5 and 0.15. So in terms of lens models, we have a singular atmosphere, a Navarro Frank and white, and a generalized Navarro Frank and white with gamma equal to two in red, blue, and green. And for this, uh, <clears throat> They have a mass of 10 to the 9 solar masses inside the Einstein radius of the CIS model. While for the fourth one, the Navarro Frank and White 2 in light blue, uh, in this model, we fix the mass inside the R200 to be equal to the one of the CIS model inside the R200. <clears throat> so uh, these lenses then given a supermassive binary black hole at redshift uh, 1 and total mass of 10 to the 8 solar masses, give this lensed waveform uh, here in the frequency domain. So again, we have the frequency on the x-axis and the characteristic strain on the y-axis. So apart from the cases that I showed just um, previous to this slide, the plot is showing also <clears throat> a couple of unlensed cases, one at red shift one and one at the shift uh, 0 0.8. <clears throat> and we can see that uh, we have different cases where 
two uh, different events overlap, meaning that they are very similar. And so our aim here, uh, once again, is to distinguish between, uh, an first of all, between an unlensed and a uh, lensed event, and then to characterize the lens model properly. So to do so, we use two methods. The first is a match study between uh, <clears throat> the lens and the unlensed waveform, or the lens waveform with two different uh, lens models. So in a match filtering analysis, the signal to noise ratio is calculated comparing the signal with a template, as I'm showing in the main equation here, where S, S of T, is the signal composed by the actual waveform and some noise. Then we have the inner product. And then capital S of N is the basically the sensitivity of the detector, the power spectral density. So we also want to define a confidence region uh, through the delta key square, which basically represents the accuracy of uh, our detection. The value of the delta key square uh, at, at three sigma uh, depends on the number of uh, free parameters that we are considering. And here we have uh, two uh, free parameters for some models, which gives a um, delta key square of 11.8. And in some cases, we have three, three parameters that gives 14.2. The second method is comparing the phase of the signals involved. <clears throat> For example, here we have normalized the phases of the lensed and unlensed signal to the one of the unlensed. So being in the wave optics regime, we see that the lensing effect uh, imprints a phase modulation uh, to the lens signal that depends on the frequency and it's not just, for example, a rescaling of it. In this case, to calculate the uncertainties uh, on the phases that we reconstruct, we use the, this equation from Cutler and Flanagan, which basically says that the accuracy goes like the inverse of the signal to noise ratio. <clears throat> Uh, so let's see um, some example to see if we are able to do, uh, first of all, to distinguish a last event from an unlensed one. So here we have the first, the first example. We have a lens event uh, by a Navarro Franco White 2 type of lens that overlap quite well with an unlensed event with uh, the source at redshift 0.8. I remind you that uh, for the lens event, the source is at that shift one. So we compute <clears throat> the match between these two signals. Uh, so here we can see that the signal to noise ratio is 220, and the match is quite high, 1 minus 4 times 10 to the minus 7. For the Navarro Franco White model, we have three parameters, three, three parameters. And the threshold is set by this delta key square and by the SNR value. <clears throat> so we can see that since the match between the signals is higher uh, than the threshold value, this means that we are not able to distinguish these two signals. And in fact, we would need an SNR or of 4,000 to, to do so. If we take a look at the phases of the signal. This is the same plot that I showed before. So we have the basically the difference in, in of the phase between the lensed and the unlensed one. And in, the case, in this case, the confidence region, so the uncertainties are given um, for the smaller one for a, SN, for a SNR of 800. And for this type of signal to ratio, we can see that we are able to distinguish the two signals. And this means that using the phase, in this case, we would need um, SNR five times lower than what we, uh, we needed before for um, just a meta-analysis. So let's now see uh, if we are able to distinguish between different lens models. Here we have an example. So we have two signals that are lensed, one by a CIS model and one by a generalized Navarro Franklin White model. And we can see again that the two signals, the red and the green one, are very similar. So let's compute once again the, um, the matching between these two, um, these two signals. 
And in this case, we can see that the match, so the second number that we have here between these two signals, is actually lower than the three sigma threshold that we are setting from the delta k square and the, and the SNR. So in this case, we are able for an SNR equal to 100 to distinguish these two signals, meaning that we are able to uh, <clears throat> characterize properly the, the lens model. This is um, confirmed by looking at the phases now of the of the signals. This time we normalize to the generalized Navarro Frank and White one. But the main point is that we can see that also including the uncertainties, we can clearly distinguish uh, the two curves. So we are able to characterize the lens model properly. The last uh, example that I'm presenting is given by uh, uh, is given by the plot here, where we again have two very similar uh, signals. In this case, these are two lens signal, one from a navarro franco white type of lens, and one again from a navarro franco white computed in a different way and with a, a different composition. So we have a closer source and a closer lens. In this case, if we compute the match between these two signals, we can see again, that uh, this match is higher than the three sigma threshold, meaning that we are not able to distinguish the two these two signals for, a, for an SNR equal to 220, but we would need one of 2200. If we take a look at the phase though, uh, now we can see that uh, we can distinguish the two curves for an SNR equal to 1000, meaning that in this case, we would need an SNR two times lower uh, for the phase uh, with respect to the match analysis. So in conclusion, uh, in this study, and in the example that I presented, uh, we show how using the phase of the lens signal and not only the match uh, between the signals, one can recognize and identify correctly the model of the lens. And this could be uh, very useful for further astrophysical and cosmological studies. So this is all from me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Paolo, for the very nice talk. And so I'm checking the chat for any question. And yeah, for the, in the context of tests of GR, I would say that uh, this is really important to have under control. So if you want to claim new physics, we better have under control these sort of effects, especially in the case where we want to target maybe subpopulations of, of yeah. dark compact objects and things like this. Definitely. So I don't see any question or any raised hand. So maybe a quick question for you, Paolo. So you show that the signal to restorations needed to spot these effects are pretty high, but have you paid any mm -hmm. thought about the impact of this on multiple events? So th there are, for example, studies where people combine multiple events to draw uh, you know, implications on astrophysical channels and things like this. And could these effects accumulate and give any impact of that? Or could you use that to spot um, such effects using some kind of combined hierarchical analysis? Mm. Okay. So um, in this case, what I'm using is just like one event. So I'm focusing on just one event. And it's it's difficult to combine different uh, effects. So one thing may be that maybe different event can be lensed by the same object and having more than one event, so more data about one one lens event, one lensing object, of course one can reconstruct better um, the mass profile. Uh, otherwise, 
mm, and maybe I'm thinking uh, that one could go to different uh, bands, for example, because if we have, like in this case, massive black holes, maybe uh, in the very early phase, this could be like, I don't know, in the PTA range and then <clears throat> merge in the LISA band, but this would take a lot of time. So I don't think we could see the same event. So thank you very much. Yeah. Quite informative. So thanks again, Paolo. I think you can uh, stop the screen sharing. Okay, so the session is technically over uh, because as we said, someone canceled, but in case people would uh, have additional questions or you know, kick want to kickstart a discussion, we still have 15 minutes of empty time. So I encourage everyone who didn't ask a question before to write one or raise the, the hand. Um, um, Gregorio, there was one question that came yes. to me, which was, I believe was one for our last speaker. Um, have you considered what happens when the signal has additional parameters to be fitted? This is because usually the waveform is not known and is found from observed data. Um, I believe that was a question for Paulo. I'm sorry. I can, I can, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I because I, yeah. I can find it. I it was, um, I, I think, I, I think it was accidentally sent only to me so I can, ah, okay, okay. I don't think I can post in the Q and A. Um, I'll go ahead. I'll, um, I'll put it in the chat so you can see it. That might Thanks. be easier. Yeah. So actually this is, uh, a very interesting question uh, and uh, so no we didn't consider um, additional parameters for the moment to be fitted uh, because we had limited hardware capacity so we tried to uh, be like as simple as possible but this is actually a very interesting question and because of course if you leave the all the waveform parameters to be free, then your space parameter is very large and everything gets much more complicated. Um, so current, basically this is what I'm doing right now. Uh, so I'm trying to see how the different parameters correlate, if the source parameter correlates with the, mm, the parameters of the lens, how they correlate and like, how bad is everything basically? Uh, but so yes, uh, leaving free the the waveform parameters will complicate everything. And but I don't have uh, like more thing to say about this like conclusive thought on this. Thank you, Paulo, for the answer. Is has anyone else have a burning question that they want to ask to what do any one of the speakers? Or a comment on the topics discussed. Okay, in the meantime, maybe I can ask a quick question to Pierre. So Pierre, you, you mentioned you checked the stability of the amplitudes of the waveform at infinity. Did you also repeat the same exercise for the horizon amplitudes? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't get for sure what you meant with uh, checking the stability. So the, oh, the amplitudes, the amplitudes, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Well, we, yeah, we did it on both cases, just not exactly in the same way because it just seemed more more appropriate in one case than the other. We we should we could have done exactly the same thing in both cases. I think for what we did in the at infinity case was to Consider the amplitude at a, like we do, we we kept the the fitting time fixed at the peak of the waveform, right? 
And then we just increase the number of tones in the model from n to n plus one. And for every tone within the model, we just check if the amplitude was staying the same. For the horizon, what we were doing is uh, to, to check the stability of the amplitude as you change the time at which you start fitting. So it's a different but related test of the stability of the amplitude. Well, I guess we could have done the same thing in principle as well. I don't know why we, we just didn't think about it at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree that both both tests should should be passed by a physical model of of right. your QNMs, which don't consider. In a certain them. sense, there is a little more information in the one where we have because we have a time dependence of this of the stability in the test that we did for the horizon. But you don't have like a clear quantitative variation between one one model and the next. Mm -hmm. I agree. And so you were showing that, for example, the, at late times, the amplitudes of the overtones were quite generically exploding instead of being constant, but they were just blowing up. Um, yes. So you 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 think that this is due to the fact that the overtones were going below the noise floor, or do you have other alternative explanations for those? It's not hundred percent clear, but my best guess would indeed be that this is. This is due to the to the overtones being completely undetectable. Or to be even more specific, I think they are they are just overfitted, like they are, they are recovered wrongly by assuming that any residual feature should be the, the overtone. And its amplitude is computed at a fixed time. So when you have a fainter data left, then this amplitude can exponentially blow up if you have a constant remaining residual feature. Because you have to extrapolate the amplitude at a, at, a, at a given fixed earlier time. And because you have a, an exponential decay, then when you extrapolate that, you, you exponentially blow up any constant, for instance. Yeah, I agree. Although I, I'm pretty convinced that if one would do, a, let's say, a proper statistical treatment, um, just so if, if the mod, oh yeah, sorry, please. If that's fine. Yeah. But I'm just showing the slide you were talking about, I think. Yeah. And for context, these are all extrapolated back to the to a single reference time, which I assume yes. is the peak of the wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for example, uh, in this case, well, this is for the horizon. So it, everything is just decaying. Uh, we, we just pick an, an arbitrary time, which is at a, roughly the transition to the linear regime somewhere here. Right. And what you would expect in a pure QNM model would be the blue, that Constant. everything would be at is the, like blue. the blue line. Yeah, what, what, what I meant is that so like this amplitude should probably be lower, but they should stay constant. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it, it would be it would be nice to have error bars uh, on because e even when one sees these kind of oscillations, I, I think that those would still be fine given that they are within the numerical uncertainty in some sense. And you know, if a mode would 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 actually be there, it, it should never they should never blow up. They should always remain. Uh, I think they should always remain in that given error band. By That's true. We could have put error bands. But I mean, yeah, here, here this is in log scale. So this is order than order of magnitude variations. It's, uh, if if within the entire range we are really recovering the tones, then so that would be completely ridiculous a variation for this. It's, it's, bit, it's a bit different in the early stage where there is some kind of stability and then it would be useful to to have error somewhere around this range or something, I think. Well, I, I agree that it's order of magnitude. It's, it's also true that um, this is being extrapolated back. So any, any kind of source of mismatch is being uh, pumped in some sense. So what I'm, what, 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 so I'm saying this because in the, in the long paper you mentioned, we did find the same behavior, but when switching then to uh, say a Bayesian method, it's not it's not that this this behavior could be cured completely, but for some of the modes, it could be reduced quite nicely by let's say uh, using standard Bayesian techniques. And M Michalis actually did something similar for for modified gravity. And yeah, I think it, it's something that might be helpful, but maybe you can discuss this offline. Yeah, sure. Oh, by the way, is it so Bayesian fitting would be definitely much. I mean, Bayesian recovery of the parameters here would be much more powerful, I think, and would constrain better the uncertainties. But I'm just remembering, actually, on this plot, there is a fitting uncertainty included. Mm -hmm. Okay. It okay. doesn't include the numerical error, but 
it was extremely low because we have this way extremely accurate simulations. So when we stayed at the dominant modes like L equals two here, the error is 10 to minus 12 or so in this plot. Okay, well, this is quite nice to hear. Okay. But this actually addresses my question. No, because the geometry of the problem was simple. So it was just some brute force pushing onto something that everyone does not need so much accuracy. So uh, just remind me again, so the, because these were uh, head-on collisions. And yes, so it's like symmetric, mm -hmm. because non-spinning okay. and head-on. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, would anyone else have uh, any other question for uh, either of the speakers? Okay, I don't see any in the Q&A or in the chat. So thank you very much to uh, all the speakers, all the ones who asked questions, all the ones who contributed, and of course, all the ones who attended. And have a nice rest of our Monday. Bye. Okay, I guess we can get started. Um, I'm to Stellar Astrophysics um, at the MLD 15. Um, I'm just the LSC person, so I'm going to turn this over to our chair, um, Peter. Thank you so much for chairing. Um, you can take it away. Okay, thanks, Megan. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is for, for you all out there. Um, all right, so this is the first uh, Stellar Astrophysics session, uh, uh, and the first speaker will be Manuel Arcaceda, who will be talking about gravitational waves from dense star clusters. And so with that, I think we'll turn it over to you, Manuel. I'll give you a three-minute um, warning of the 15 minutes, just to let you know that we're aiming, a reminder that we're aiming for that to leave time for questions. Perfect. Okay. So... Hopefully you see everything now and and hear me. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes, just fine. Great. Right. So okay. So I'm Manuel, and today I will uh, just uh, uh, discuss about how IMBH is formed in star clusters. So I will talking about the formation of intermediate mass black holes, compact binary mergers in dense star clusters. This is a work uh, as part of the Grace Black Hole Project. And I want to acknowledge funding from uh, the European Union through a Marie Curie Action and the Merak Foundation. It's a work in collaboration with the University of Heidelberg, the University of Padova, and the Grand Sasso Science Institute. So this is a brief summary of my talk. I will uh, introduce the problem of MBHs, especially in star clusters. How do they form or can form in star clusters? And then we will spend a few um, slides on the relations and links to compact binary mergers. So we are used to categorize black holes into at least two main categories. One is stellar black holes. So they are coming from the depth of massive stars. And we have supermassive black holes residing in the center of galaxies. And in between, in the mass range between 100 and a few hundred thousand solar masses, we expect to exist a link, a missing link, that we call uh, intermediate mass black hole. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have clues about this uh, unexplored landscape. In fact, actually, we just have evidences, observational evidences for MBHs in the center of dwarf galaxy uh, and galactic and dwarf galactic nuclei. But these MBHs have masses of the order of 50,000, 100,000 solar masses. And on the low end of the uh, of this mass range, we have one uh, beautiful observation from the LIGO Virgo and Kagra collaboration of a black hole with a mass of 150 solar masses produced by the merging of two stellar mass black holes. This is what they call GW19 of 521. In between, we have a few candidates that may be IMVHs, mostly in uh, star clusters, globular clusters in the Milky Way. But the majority of the claims about these candidates are most of the times are controversial and are widely and wildly uh, debated. So this is really an, an unexplored landscape and we don't know much about them. In fact, a natural question that may arise about MBHs is whether they are really a category of black holes per se or rather this mass range is just populated by the heaviest stellar mass black holes and the lightest uh, supermassive black holes. So in order for scenario one to work, IMBHs are really a category of black holes, 
there may there, there must exist at least one or a few processes that are capable of building up these MBHs through the whole 100, 100,000 square mass range. And one possible place where such processes could um, efficiently build up uh, IMBHs are star clusters. These are perfect laboratories, in fact, because there you can have a combination of processes like, for example, at the beginning, you will have a collection of stars. The most massive one will undergo mass segregation via dynamical friction, and they will segregate in the cluster center. The most massive will turn into uh, black holes, and the black holes and other stars will start interacting. The star cluster density start rising up to a peak that we call core collapse. And at this peak of density, we have the main, the, the, the main efficiency in the formation of three body interactions, binary single interaction, binary binary interactions. And this kind of um, gravitational interactions are the one that can lead to the formation of tight binaries where black holes are paired together and eventually may merge. Some black holes uh, can grow to an IMBH side, uh, sides and eventually can settle in the cluster center and merge again, or depending on the cluster structure, can be ejected away in some dynamical recoil or via gravitational wave recoil. So star clusters are a nice place where studying the impact of dynamics on the formation of IMBHs, or at least IMBH seeds. And our contribution to the discussion, um, latest contribution to the discussion, is the um, presentation of these Dragon 2 star cluster models, which are constitute a suit of almost 20 M-body simulations of star clusters uh, characterized by densities, initial densities up to 10 to the 7 solar mass per cubic parsec, up to 1 million stars, and up to 33% of them initially paired in primordial binaries. Ideally, these cluster models represent young and mid-age massive clusters. And last week, we uh, posted on the archive three papers where we discuss and dissect the results from this uh, suite of simulations. So if you are interested in the details, please have a look at the papers, provide comments. We are really, uh, comments are really welcome. Um, so first thing first, we need to check uh, whether our cluster models are reliable or not. We didn't think of the initial conditions as a representative of a special star cluster. Rather, we um, considered a range of values for the initial mass, ratio, mass, the initial alpha mass radius, and then we evolved these simulations. And what you see in this plot is the time evolution of the alpha mass radius on the bottom, the total mass of the cluster on the top, um, compared and overlaid to the uh, observed mass and alpha mass radii of several uh, young clusters in the Magellanic clouds, in the M31 galaxy, in the Milky Way, this blue dot, the blue stars here, in the, and in some dwarf galaxies like in ice 210 and M83. So luckily you see that our simulations fall in the ballpark of the observed clusters. So at least we are not, we are sure we are not simulating anything crazy and some reliable systems, in fact, these dragon clusters may represent one possible pathway, uh, evolutionary pathway, uh, to star clusters that we see today in the local universe. Out of 19 simulations, we find uh, eight IMBHs, so around 40% of simulations produce an IMBH, with a mass in between 100 and 370 solar masses. So it's quite a high uh, formation efficiency. Uh, consider that in previous works, this uh, frequency, this, uh, this efficiency was around 20 to 30 percent. And uh, the main um, the main processes that contribute to the formation of such IMBHs are stellar mergers. Two of them, two of the IMBHs in our sample form by uh, merging the stars. And what you see in this plot is the mass of the IMBH when it forms and then the spin at formation, and then some uh, other processes contribute to the growth of the mass of the MBH. Eventually, uh, once the sequence is truncated, the MBH is ejected from the cluster. 
Then we have one MBH forming out of a stellar feeding onto a rather normal black hole, as this is square here. And the black hole after the IMDH after formation is ejected from the cluster itself in a strong three body interaction. And then we have most of the IMDHs in our sample forming via black hole black hole mergers. And these are all the five uh, objects. So the whole uh, sample of IMDHs in our system is represented here. Again, on the x axis, we have the mass. On the y-axis on top, we have the spin of the MBH. And on the bottom, we have the recoil kick received by the MBH when it merged with uh, another uh, compact object, typically a black hole. And be aware that actually this line here sets uh, a maximum value for the kick of 100 kilometers per second. So both this line actually is really unlikely for normal star clusters to retain the merger product. And uh, this, this means that uh, whenever one of our black hole exceeds this line, it is more likely that it is ejected from the star cluster and doesn't grow anymore. We can discuss more about the details about this because as interesting um, um, impact, uh, as an interesting impact on the evolutionary um, history of IMBHs in star cluster. So how do they form in our, in our simulations, these IMBHs? Well, this is one example. We have multiple stellar collisions. Initially, we have a binary. The binary is perturbed by another star coming in. And the perturbation is so chaotic and strong that actually trigger the merger between the companion in the binary and the perturber. The new binary formed this way is perturbed again. And in this three body interaction, eventually the binary merge and form a very massive star that after a while merge with the uh, with this companion. So eventually this leads to a star of 365 solar masses that turn into a black hole. And later the black hole actually collide with a star, a massive star, eventually reaching a final mass of 350 solar masses. This happens on a very short time scale within 10 mega year. Much later, this black hole capture a stellar mass black hole form a tight binary the tight binary is ejected ultimately from the cluster and merge outside it in the, in the empty space. Another way to form IMBHs is, is, is a bit more complex. In this case, we have two binaries which are initially separated. They don't talk to each other. They undergo some uh, stellar evolution. In one case, the stellar evolution leads eventually to a black hole with a mass of almost 100 solar masses. In the other case, um, the, the black hole that forms out of stellar evolution is also in this case around 100 solar masses. The two black holes start interacting with other black holes, form binaries, form three, bi three body interactions, and eventually the two black holes find each other and merge after 200 mega year. The gravitational wave recoil uh, uh, imparted on the remnant is so large that actually this object is then ejected from the cluster and doesn't grow anymore. So the first take home I want to convey is that the IMDH seeds can form in dense star cluster. Um, and this happens usually via a combination of stellar collisions, star black hole interactions, and black hole black hole mergers. Unfortunately, dynamics is so efficient, dynamics and relativistic effects are so efficient to evacuate all the IMDHs forming in our simulations. Okay, and well, we found that three minutes left. Yep. And uh, interestingly, we found uh, a dependence on the cluster density. The most dense cluster tend to form IMBHs via stellar collisions much earlier in time. And the IMBH resulting from it, these are more massive. As I've shown here, this is mass of the IMBH, time of formation, and colored, you have the density of the cluster. On a sparser cluster, instead, the IMBH formation is longer and the process, the dominant process is black hole, black hole mergers. And this is our second take home. In the last few minutes, I will talk about uh, uh, the main channel through which IMH is formed, which is black hole, black hole binary mergers. This is discussed in paper three. What, uh, what you have seen until now is discussed in paper two. So in our simulations, we found 78 mergers, meaning that uh, we find uh, around two mergers every 10 to the 5 solar mass uh, 
simulated solar masses. Um, I dissected the population into these numbers here, but I think that the plot is more instructive. You see here on the x-axis, the primary mass, on the y-axis, the mass ratio and color, it is given explicitly the, the, the mass of the companion. So you see here, we have a particularly rich uh, uh, population of mergers. We have uh, beyond this line here on right side, on the right side of this line here, we have black hole mergers that lead to an IMBH. We have black holes in the so-called upper mass gap. We have black holes uh, with masses at the border at the transition between neutron star and black holes. We also found some exotic mergers, two black hole neutron stars and one black hole white dwarf mergers. So it's a particularly rich uh, population. And we found uh, an interesting uh, difference between the mergers coming uh, purely from dynamical interactions, which are encompassed by these blue lines here, and those that instead comes from uh, the evolution of the binaries that are initially put by end into the cluster. Typically, uh, primordial binaries are ejected away, uh, most of them. These are uh, ejected binaries are represented by uh, these squares here. Uh, so uh, primordial binaries mostly merge outside the cluster, while dynamical binaries are equally divided into those happening uh, in the cluster and those which merge outside it. And uh, interestingly, um, many of the mergers, when they decouple from the dynamic of the cluster and their evolution is solely driven by gravitational wave evolution, uh, many of them have an eccentricity, which is uh, uh, definitely substantial. And this is shown in this plot here, where we show the characteristic strain and frequency of uh, several of our mergers, while they sweep across different frequency bands. We overlaid the sensitivity curves from LISA, the SIGO, Einstein telescope, and LIGO. And colored, we have the eccentricity. Here we are just showing the uh, dominant harmonic. So you see that many binaries have, uh, um, appear to be eccentric in LISA. Definitely many of them can be seen eccentric in the SIGO, potentially, and a few of them can be seen eccentric in LIGO. This is a, shown better on the right side plot, where it is shown the, the fraction of binaries with an eccentricity above the corresponding uh, value on the x-axis. So this means that uh, around, uh, um, sorry, around 40%, for example, of our mergers are eccentric in the Desiertes band where the SIGO may be active. And this is our take home uh, number three, in fact. Mergers can preserve a substantial eccentricity in both Milliers, Desiertes, and Earth's uh, frequency bands. Interestingly, the amount of mergers in each band can be connected with the formation history of these binaries. And finally, we uh, computed the, the merger rate. So first, we tried to, to find some relation between the merger efficiency, so the number of mergers per uh, mass unit, and the cluster uh, properties. And for example, we show here the initial density of the cluster and this merger efficiency. And you see that the denser the cluster, the larger the amount of mergers that occur. And also, we show here the so-called uh, number binary fraction, which is slightly different from the binary fraction. And we can see that keeping exactly the same cluster structure, going from a smaller amount of binaries to a larger amount of binaries increases the number of mergers as well. So these um, um, highlight the importance of the choice of initial conditions in uh, understanding better how compact binary can uh, form, merge in dense star clusters. And then we computed the merger rate um, following the work by Santoligui et al. Basically, we assume something, uh, uh, we made some assumption about the cosmic star formation rate, and this is mostly in the first part of the integral. And then we calculate how many mergers form at redshift zeta first and merge at the redshift zeta. And, uh, and then we compute the merger rate. What we found is a merger rate of 12 events per year in gigaparsec cubic, cubic gigaparsec, sorry. So this is slightly on the uh, lower end of the distribution predicted by LIGO Virgo, meaning that uh, from young clusters, we may expect 30 to 40% of the, of the merger population. 
uh, at least for black hole black, uh, black hole mergers. And these are our last take home. Well, yeah, so, okay. yeah, and concluding. So practically, we have um, explored the formation of MBHs. We have uh, dissected the population of uh, compact object. And I want to uh, close the discussion with a question: whether or not we prove, uh, and we know now whether MBHs are really a category per se or not. Well, this uh, I think remain an excellent question. Thanks for the attention. All right, thanks very much. We do have time for about one question, maybe two. Uh, if you'd like to put it in the box or just, um, let's see, raise your hand. I think we can see raised hands. I wanted to ask you, the, the 19, uh, so the 19 um, uh, different simulations, so the 19 different models are with different conditions. So that's to, what to span what different densities. Uh, what about other parameters? Yeah, let me just show you. So we basically decided to explore a region of the phase space that wasn't explored previously in the M body simulation. So what I'm showing here is the number of stars against the initial density. And these uh, red squares are simulations from Monte Carlo models, um, quite famous uh, databases. And this is the population of M-body models that uh, are now exist in the literature. There have been uh, some important improvements and we built upon those improvements. And now um, we, our M-body models stand here. So practically, what is the point? M-body simulations are more accurate typically of, uh, with respect to Monte Carlo models. Um, um, but are much more computationally expensive. So our models now, which are direct and body, uh, provide, <clears throat> provide a link between what we have done so far with embodies and what has been done with Monte Carlo. So this is more or less the parameter space we are investigating. Of course, there are there is a peak here and uh, our models uh, density, minimum density is 40,000. Uh, solar masses per cubic pass. So this is more or less the region of the phase space we are exploring. Okay, thanks. And uh, Vishal, yeah, I see you have a hand. Um, <clears throat> yes, so uh, uh, nice talk, Manuel. So when you were okay. showing the, um, uh, like uh, the mergers, they constitute primordial binaries as well as like uh, normal dynamical interactions. So the, uh, the primordial bi uh, binaries, are they merging, merging primarily because of, uh, stuff like let's say common envelope or stable mass transfer or are dynamical encounters also playing a role and if they are why are we seeing let's say mass ratio equals to 0.5 ish sources and why are they not getting exchanged yeah so um most of them most of them are uh, just produced by uh, stellar evolution so there is little um effect from from dynamics and maybe that some eccentricity in some of them has been uh, maybe excited a bit, but it's uh, it's really um, it's really a minority, a, a, you know, a small fraction of them, maybe one or two of them. Most of them are just uh, um, forming via stellar evolution, and uh, they undergo some of them undergo common envelope, some of some of them undergo mass transfer. The small population here of um, with mass ratios of around 0.5, I think uh, this is mostly due to the fact to the to our initial assumptions. Um, I see. Yeah, but there is one interesting thing that is uh, there is a population of binaries um, that is halfway between dynamical and merger, which is this one. We call it mixed. So these are binary mergers that occur um, either inside or outside the cluster, and at least one of the components was former member of a binary. So there is some post-processing and pre-processing of these uh, binaries. No. I see, I see. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Great. We should move on, but thank you very much, Manuel. Thanks, thanks. And uh, that brings us to our next speaker, who is uh, Vishal Baibab. And uh, Vishal, you'll tell us about uh, supernova kicks and black hole spins, right? Yes, and I hope you can see my screen. Yes, it looks good. Um, yes. So, uh, hi, I'm Vishal. I'm a postdoc uh, at Sierra. I've, I'm working with Tiki Calogero. And 
Today, I'm going to uh, talk about black hole spins and supernova kicks. So it has been almost eight years since we first detected gravitational waves from binary black holes. But one question that still uh, really does not let us sleep is where are these binary black holes coming from? Now, the simplest signature to tell uh, different channels apart is their spins. Um, so if you have uh, aligned spins, binary black holes, they are typically thought to come from uh, isolated formation scenarios. On the other hand, if you have spins like isotropic or all over the place, we can say that they are coming from uh, probably clusters, right? Today, I am going to challenge this notion. Uh, we are going to say why dynamical environments do not have the monopoly on highly misaligned binaries. Uh, and the previous assumption why it is not so robust. So first of all, where is this assumption coming from that the um, um, binaries from field, they should have aligned spin. This is coming from the fact that if you looked at these parent stars, they usually have aligned spins. So uh, when they die, they become black holes. They should also have aligned spins. But what if these black holes, they do not inherit they spin from their stars. So there could be very efficient angular momentum transport that is uh, stopping the black holes from getting the spins from their parents. And we have many uh, young pulsar observations, which are very, very highly uh, misaligned. Uh, so if not, if uh, black holes and neutron stars do not get their spins from their parents, where do they get their spins from? So the next obvious possibility is that they, instead of having aligned spins, they can have completely isotropic spins. So you can get this if you have, let's say, internal gravity waves um, that, are, that is driven by uh, shell burning, which can impart some angular momentum to the core. Um, you can have uh, things like uh, the when there's a direct collapse, the star might accrete some convective layers, which can also give the black hole some uh, spin in a random direction. In all these cases, you should expect the spins to be isotropic. Um, the next possibility is you can have spins perpendicular to the kick that the black hole or the neutron star receives uh, when, it's form, when it forms during the supernova. And this is something that we see in the observation. This has been known since early 2000s, where we see if you look at the pulsar kicks and the pulsar spins, we find that they are usually in the same directions. And different hydrodynamical mechanisms have also been proposed to explain this. So for example, uh, two years ago, there was a paper by um, Yanka, which said that if the neutron star gets kicked, it's going to accrete um, the infalling material only in one direction, which kind of gives you spin parallel to the kick. Now you can assume that the kicks are isotropic, and then one might naively expect that the spin should also be isotropic, but this is not the case. So if you have kick which is in the orbital plane, there's a big chance you disrupt the binary. So since kick and spin are in the same direction, V, as you increase the kick magnitude, we do not prefer uh, spins that are in plane. Uh, if you increase the kick magnitude even further, you start tilting the uh, orbital plane by a huge amount and uh, by almost 90 degrees in some cases. And that's why at, at very large kicks, you start preferring in plane spins. The next possibility is what if spins uh, black hole or neutron sp spins are perpendicular to the kick. Uh, now, this could happen if the supernova explosion, it's not starting exactly in the center, but maybe a bit offset from the center. And this was first proposed by Finney and in 1998. Now, this is kind of going to uh, uh, a neutron star or a neutron star spin perpendicular to the kick. And there have also been um, supernova simulations where the asymmetric fallback of ejecta can give you like uh, like perpendicular spins and kicks. In this case, we can expect the opposite. Uh, uh, we this time we do not prefer aligned and anti-aligned uh, binaries. And again, as you start increasing the kick further, uh, you start seeing these very interesting uh, features. So uh, I discussed like four different possibilities, but what LIGO or any other 
uh, detector is going to see, it's going to depend on a lot of other factors. For example, tides, what are the natal, uh, uh, spin mag uh, natal kick magnitudes? Uh, what are the mass losses? Uh, is there any mass transfer? Um, so today we'll only look at two. Uh, uh, so, um, give me a second. Yes. So uh, let's say if you have the black hole which is being spun up because of the kick, in these cases, you can expect that the spin magnitude should be proportional to the kick magnitude. And in general, we expect that the lighter black holes, they receive larger kicks. In those cases, the blue lines, they should also have larger spin magnitudes. On the other hand, heavier black holes, they should receive smaller kicks because there could be huge fallback, which kind of uh, suppresses the kick magnitude, which should also suppress the spin magnitude. Next, look at what the uh, tilt distribution is going to be like. So, of course, if uh, black holes get their spins from their parents, they should be uh, aligned to a, a good degree. If it's isotropic, it should be like it should be a flat line. If you have spins perpendicular to kick, like we discussed earlier, uh, they tend to disfavor more aligned and anti-aligned binaries. And finally, if you have spins parallel to the kicks, uh, you start disfavoring in-plane spins. Um, we can see um, uh, similar correlations in the chi-effective distribution. So LIGO uh, cannot measure uh, spin directions and spin magnitudes that accurately, but it, uh, it, it can uh, measure chi-effective very, very accurately. So if black holes get their spins entirely from their uh, parent stars. In that case, we expect the chi, the, we expect the chi effective to be mostly positive with uh, tails in the negative chi effective regions because when the kick is large, it, there is a possibility that you uh, tilt, uh, you can have tilts like this. If it's isotropic, um, you do not see any correlation between different masses. On the other hand, if you have spins perpendicular to the kick or spins parallel to the kick, we again start seeing the correlation between mass and um, uh, the chi effective. So if the uh, mass is small, which is the blue line, in that case, we should expect large kick magnitudes, We should, which means that we sh should have a wider chi effective distribution. On the other hand, if we have larger, uh, larger masses, that is going to suppress the kick magnitude and also the spin magnitude, which means that the distribution should be narrow. So with O3 and with future detections, we might be able to uh, resolve these things and we might be able to see where exactly this, the spins of the black holes are coming from. So as of now, um, in all these cases that I discussed, except for natal spins, um, we saw that there's a symmetry between above the binary plane and below the binary plane. But what happens, let's say, if we have something like, let's say, mass transfer or let's say tides. In these cases, the uh, tides or mass transfer, they're going to spin up the uh, either the black hole or the black hole's progenitor perpendicular to the orbital plane. And this way, you kind of um, break this uh, symmetry. And what you see that the peaks that we were seeing earlier, which were symmetric above the plane and below the plane, uh, now uh, they are more dominated for uh, uh, above the plane. And interestingly, very interestingly, this is what we are seeing with LIGO already. So um, uh, since past almost a year, we have had a few papers where they are looking at um, uh, the uh, tail distribution from GWTC3, and they uh, find that the uh, tail distribution is uh, not peaked at aligned, or it's not completely flat either, but it's more like it has um, a peak at uh, 60 degrees, I think. Um, okay, so earlier, give me a sec. Uh, yeah, so earlier, uh, I, we discussed that there are binary pulsars um, which have um, which have spins that are highly misaligned. Now, what we can do is we can uh, use our models to infer the properties of uh, these supernova properties for these uh, these binaries. And I'll give you only one example. So this is 
uh, one of the young pulsars where the um, the a younger pulsar has a misalignment of almost 130 degrees. What we can do is we can uh, use this to find things like what the kick magnitudes are and what the mass loss is. Uh, that holds for if you assume that these spins are coming from entirely from the progenitors or they are being uh, they are coming from uh, the kicks. And what we find is that if you um, want spins to come from their parents we need very, very large kick magnitudes. Uh, we can extend this even further. We can use, we can do this for all the um, uh, binary pulsars or LMXPs we have seen where we have good enough um, tilt measurement. And we can find things like uh, which of the models is uh, favored. While we cannot uh, tell about which of these is true, but what we can say is that the natal spin model is very heavily disfavored. So we can see that base factor is disfavored by base factor of uh, more than 100 depend or around several tens, depending on what kind of priors you have. So um, to recap, uh, we discussed um, different uh, possibilities for uh, spin misalignments from the field binaries. So the natal spins, they are not the only, only possibilities. You can have completely isotropic spins, which can result from either internal gravity waves or accreting um, uh, convective layers. You can have spins perpendicular to the kick, which is something um, that we can expect if you have you have explosion not happening in the center, or if you have a symmetric fallback, and spins parallel to the kick. This is which is what we see in the uh, pulsar observations as well. And um, one major key, key takeaway would be from the last uh, twelve minutes is that uh, dynamical environment or binaries that come from clusters, they do not have monopoly over highly misaligned sources. So if you have, if LIGO sees something uh, which is very, a binary which is heavily processing or where the uh, chi effective is negative or where uh, spin tilts are like huge, uh, these can also come from uh, the field uh, channel as well. So that's all I have, thank you. Thank you, that's great. And we do have time for a few questions. Please feel free to ask. Manuel, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about the, um, how much the picture would change if you allowed the two black holes to different masses? Would um, it affect the results? Yes. Uh, so in general, you would expect that if you have, if the uh, black hole mass is small, um, you would, it's easier to tilt binaries. Um, uh, and on the other hand, if you, even if you assume that they have the same kick magnitude, the uh, lighter black holes or lighter binaries, they are easier to tilt. So you can see different features like peaks, um, they're more pronounced. On the other hand, if you are heavier binaries, these are less pronounced. Thanks. And Anurada, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Vishal, for this very wonderful um, and intuitive uh, presentation. Thanks, uh, Anurada. I have a couple of uh, questions about, uh, uh, means uh, I try to understand things, but maybe uh, I, you might have said and I missed it. So do you, uh, do we have, uh, first is that, do we have any uh, prediction for the spin magnitude? Of um, the black holes from uh, these channels. Uh, yes, that's a good question. So, in most of these cases, I would say uh, so. In all these different cases, I kind of listed different sub uh, classes. So, for example, let's say if you have isotropic spins, um, they can come from internal gravity waves or um, uh, by accreting convection. So, you can go back to these papers. Uh, give me. Let me go back. So you can go to uh, these papers. So for example, Fuller in, in 2014, they have different predictions for, for spin magnitude, or you can go to uh, uh, 
uh, these papers where they talk about uh, accreting convective layers and they have different predictions. The same goes for uh, spins being parallel to the kicks and spins being perpendicular to the kicks. One example I can give you is uh, Finney's Freud model where you have uh, the explosion that is not happening exactly in the center. In that case, the angular momentum can be just like the uh, R cross V where R is the offset uh, from the center and V is the kick magnitude. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. I had a follow-up question. I, mean, I had a second question on that. So uh, you said that uh, the, uh, the tilts can be proportional to the kicks. Um, the tilts? Um, not necessarily. I, I think I said spin magnitudes can be proportional to the kicks. Okay. And in these cases, yes, this is this might not always be true. Uh, so for example, in the Finney Sprout model, um, this is true because you have angular momentum equals to R cross V where V is the kick magnitude. So yes, the spin is proportional to the magn uh, kick magnitude, but there are supernovae simulations um, where they find that even if they do see a correlation between the uh, kick magnitude, the kick and the spin direction, they do not see any correlation between spin magnitude and kick. So uh, it depends on what kind of, uh, what exactly is spinning up uh, your black hole or neutron star. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, so because if if there are correlation between kick and the spin magnitude, then there are constraints on the spin magnitude because if the kicks are so yes. high, that means the spin magnitudes are high, if the kicks are so high, then the binary will be disrupted, right? So there is yes, some yes, constraints on uh, having a spin magnitude in these models. Yes, indeed. Okay. Thank you. Okay, is there another question from anyone? Okay, if not, uh, thank you, Vishal. And we'll move on to our last talk of the session. Uh, this is by uh, Victor Santos Gages uh, about the broadening of universal relations for proto-neutron stars and post merger remnants. So Victor, go ahead. All right, can you hear me? Yes, see? we can hear you and see your slide. Okay, great. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Thanks to Nanograph for organizing the conference. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, this work in progress uh, with my advisor, Ken Yagi. Uh, this is not really related to what we have seen in this section, but I hope we can get something for you. So I'm talking about the broadening of well-established universal relations for cold neutron stars, but for more dynamical systems like proto-neutron stars or post-merger remnants. So I'd like to start with the proto-neutron stars case. We know that uh, neutron stars, they are a possible final stage for the evolution of massive stars. And the process responsible for their formation is a quark collapse supernova. But here we are interested in the early post bounce phase uh, after the supernova explosion, which is when we have this metastable object that is soon to be a neutron star and we call it a proto neutron star. Um, also, that depends uh, if it's cooling down to become a neutron star or collapsing to a black hole. It depends on the mass of the progenitor, of course. And just like neutron stars, uh, these objects are extremely dense, but they are also very hot which means that their equation of state uh, is not a simple pressure density relation, just like in the case of a cold neutron star. We could also have entropy and composition gradients that could affect uh, the macro properties of these objects. So lately there has been a lot of effort in modeling the evolution of these objects. And here in the left, I'm showing one of these works where the authors successfully obtained a uh, 3D model for the explosion. And as we can see, this is a very asymmetric environment and the turbulent, uh, the turbulent nature of the explosion itself can perturb the proto-neutron star, which is represented by this isodensity surface here, uh, the white surface here. And this uh, perturbation can excite uh, its quasi-normal modes and lead to the gravitational wave emission. So here in the right, I'm showing the gravitational wave spectrogram for this uh, frequencies for one model, uh, where we can see that for early times, we have a kind of a mixture of modes, but for later times, uh, for a post bounce time of uh, around 0 0.5 and a half, 
we see that the signal seems to be dominated by the mode whose eigenfunction inside the star has zero nodes, which you call the F mode, which represents the, uh, which describes the oscillations of the fluid coupled to the space time of that object. So in order to model our proton-neutron stars, uh, we use results from 3D car collapse supernova simulations that were kindly provided by the Princeton group. So we use uh, these uh, the results of these simulations in order to extract the equation of state for each time slice. So here in the left, I'm showing a figure from their paper where they are showing the uh, time evolution of the average shock radius for eight uh, different progenitor masses. These are the models that we are considering here. And in order to solve uh, the structure equations for the proton neutron stars, we consider a time-dependent effective pressure, pressure density relation, uh, which I'm showing here in the right. Uh, we consider uh, only one equation of state, which is the only one that we have available data. And also I'm showing the zero temperature counterpart for this equation of state here. So once we have uh, the equation of state at each time slice, we can solve for the structure of these objects and we can use relativistic perturbation theory to get those quasi-normal modes. And here, uh, like I said before, we are interested in the F mode because as we saw, the gravitational wave signal seems to be dominated uh, by the F mode for later times. And also this mode uh, has shown to satisfy some tight and well-established universal relations for cold neutron stars. For example, the F love relation, which I'm going to talk about later. So here in the right, uh, I'm showing the numerical results for the frequency and the damping time, which correspond to the real and imaginary part of the complex frequency for the F mode. These uh, results are for the proton neutron stars that we have. And we see that the frequency and the damping time are respectively lower and very higher than the Newtonian sorry, not Newtonian, the cold neutron star counterparts that I'm showing here in the footnote. Uh, another thing that I would like to mention is that uh, the surface of the proton neutron star, which is not really a surface because we have a smooth transition between the bulk content and the outside materials. Uh, the surface is defined by a density cutoff. We can change this density cutoff and that would change the frequencies and the universal relations as well. And I'll show that later. So in this work, uh, besides the F love relation, which is the one that I'm showing here, which relates the F mode and the tidal deformability of stars, of cold neutron stars in this case, uh, I'm also interested in the I love Q relation, which is one of the most well studied universal relations that we have in the literature. This uh, universal relation relates uh, the moment of inertia, the quadrupole moment and the tidal deformability of cold neutron stars. Uh, in an EOS uh, insensitive way, as we can see here. In both of these relations, we see that the fits are extremely accurate and the EOS variability is around 1% or even less. And these are, are our results uh, for, for the evolution of these universal relations for the proton neutron stars. Here, I'm showing the I love and the Q love relations. Uh, and here, I'm showing the uh, real and imaginary part of the complex frequency related to the tidal deformability. Uh, in both cases, we have here the black curve denoting the neutron star case, the neutron star curve, and the colorful curves denotes the proton neutron stars generated by the different mass progenitors. So in both of these cases, we see that the proton neutron star relations nicely approach the neutron star uh, relations. In this case, time the post-bounce time increases from right to left because we are uh, approaching the more compact model, so the tidal deformability is decreasing. And since the maximum time that we have in the simulations that we are considering is around one second, we can say that the relations are recovered to within one second. And with, with that, I would like to conclude this part. We see that the I love Q and the F love relations are recovered to within one second of post bounce time. And as I mentioned before, if we change the surface density, uh, we could have different frequencies, different results, uh, numerical results for the frequencies, and we could have different relations. And we see that if we increase the surface density, the density cutoff for our models, uh, the deviation 
for the proto-neutron star relations and the neutron star relations get lower. And of course, in all cases, they all approach the cold neutron star case as time increases. Here I'm showing uh, in the right picture the error, the percentage error for the I-love relation and the F-love relation. So with these results, uh, we are actually, uh, we have uh, this question, this open question, which is whether a future detection of a gravitational wave signal from a car collapse supernova could provide an estimate for a proton neutron star parameter using, for example, the F-love relation. And according to these results, uh, in principle, yes, we could use this to get a rough estimate for a proton neutron star parameter, like the tidal deformability and we could map these uh, parameter estimation into other parameters like the mass or the radius. However, we need to be careful with that because uh, this is for one equation of state only and for uh, one simulation group only, we would need to verify if this uh, universal behavior still verifies for other simulations and other equations of state when they are available. So with that, I move to the second part, uh, which uh, I discuss post-merger remnants. So uh, currently, uh, to date, we have two binary neutron star merger events. Uh, these are their numbers. Uh, we have learned a lot with these events. And in particular, we detected gravitational waves from the spiral phase of these binaries. And with that, we were able to measure uh, the binary tidal deformability of the systems, which uh, can be used to constrain the uh, equation of state for cold neutron star matter. However, uh, unfortunately, due to the high frequencies, uh, we could not detect the post-merger phase, but we can still learn in the future, we will be able to learn a lot about uh, neutron star physics uh, with this phase of the uh, uh, binary system. So actually, what we could learn from that depend on the possible outcomes when these two neutron stars merge, when, the, when these two neutron stars merge. And these outcomes depend on the masses of, of the masses of the star in the binary. So if the stars are very massive, we could have a prompt collapse to a black hole, like, like I'm showing here uh, in the first uh, row. Uh, if the stars are have a, enough low mass, we could have an intermediate phase of a hypermassive neutron star, which is a star that is, like the name says, it's very massive, uh, it spins very fast, and it survives only thanks to differential rotation. And in a scale of milliseconds collapses to a black hole, or we could have an intermediate phase uh, described by a supermassive neutron star that is sustained by uniform rotation and takes seconds to hundreds of seconds to collapse to a black hole or to cool down to a neutron star. Uh, we could actually distinguish all of these cases uh, with their gravitational wave signatures. So I'm showing here in the right uh, the possibilities uh, the cases of a prompt collapse to a black hole where we see the inspired merger ring down of the signal. Here at the bottom, we can see the hypermassive neutron star case where we see the spiral phase, the quasi periodic signal here after the merger and the collapse to a black hole. And here at the top, we can see uh, the last case of a supermassive neutron star where we see the spiral and the post merger phase without uh, finding apparent horizon or without collapse to a black hole. So in order to see uh, what happens uh, with universal relations for hypermassive neutron stars, uh, we are choosing to focus on this case in this second part of the work. Uh, we are using numerical relativity simulations. And here in the left, I'm showing a picture uh, of the paper that I'm considering. We are considering two mass ratios, uh, 0 0.9 and 1, and a particular equation of state. So here we can see the time evolution of the gravitational wave signal. And in particular, we can also see the quasi-periodic oscillations uh, of the hypermassive neutron stars, which can be described by the F mode of these stars. One interesting thing about this work is that when modeling the remnant, uh, the authors use uh, a prescription that allows one to define what they call a TOV equivalent which is a profile of a TOV core or a cold neutron star core that resembles the one of the remnant. So this prescription uh, or this measurement is defined in terms of something that we call the bulk. And the bulk is defined as the region enclosed by the maximum compactness 
And here we define compactness in terms of the baryonic mass and the volumetric radius of the hypermassive neutron star, which are things that can be extracted from numerical activity simulations. And this maximum uh, is defined with respect to the surface baryonic density, uh, which uh, can be defined uh, by, uh, not, not really defined, but we can find after we find the maximum of the compactness uh, that we call the bulk compactness. So the advantage of this is that although this prescription or this measurement is meant for post-merger remnants, in our case, hypermassive neutron stars, we can also use this for cold neutron stars. And here in the right, I'm showing an example on how we can find uh, this bulk compactness or how can we define the bulk itself, uh, where we see here curves uh, relating the compactness with the surface density of neutron stars. And we see that once we have found the bulk compactness, this compactness function is almost insensitive to the low density parts of the star. And that's why we call it a bulk, because it comprises uh, the most relevant matter part of the star. So uh, if this uh, compactness function is insensitive uh, for the low density parts of the star, this means that this bulk compactness could be a good candidate for universal relations uh, or other bulk quantities. For example, the frequency of the F mode of the book itself. And this is actually- We're about one minute left. If you oh, can. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is actually what we find. We find a new quasi-universal relation between the bulk compactness that I just described how we get and the dimensionless complex frequency, which is defined in terms of the baryonic mass and the frequency itself. So um, we found a linear relation between the frequency and the compactness. And we, through a linear fit, uh, we found that uh, this relation has an error of less than approximately 10% for a small sample of 10 EOSs, like I'm showing here in the figure in the right. So once we have this relation and we also have the data from the, from the numerical relativity simulations, we can directly compare these two things because we can extract the mass, the baryonic mass and the volumetric radius of the proton of the hypermassive neutron stars, and then we can define the, the compactness, the bulk compactness. And we have these things, we have these uh, parameters for the cold neutron stars. So we can compare, and this is what we, we are doing here uh, for the different mass ratios. So the gray dashed line here represent the quasi-periodic oscillations of the hypermassive neutron stars, and the pluses represent the, the peak frequency that we can get from the uh, Fourier transform. And from this, we can see that this quasi-universal relation is clearly broken because uh, as expected, we did not include rotational and thermal effects in these relations. However, uh, this could not guarantee that we could have a universal relation for these objects or not. And with that, I would like to conclude this second part. We saw that uh, for this particular FC relation, uh, we could not use that. Uh, we could not apply that to post-merger remnants, but in general, we can say that no relation that is meant for code or non-rotating neutron stars can be applied for post-merger remnants. And uh, we are left with this question that uh, if we add thermal or rotational effects into these relations, could we recover this peak frequency and unveil a hidden universality between this peak frequency and post-merger parameters. We still don't know that. So I'm showing an example here on how we could uh, do that in a rough way. We have here the quasi-periodic oscillation for the hypermassive neutron star and the corresponding TOV equivalent frequency. If we start from the non-rotating frequency and add fast rotation, we get closer to the peak frequency. So what would happen if we add thermal effects contributions, if we had differential rotation contributions, would we get closer? And what happens if we consider other equations of state, other simulations? So we don't have that available yet, and that's uh, our future perspective. Uh, with that, I finish. And since this is a work in progress, I would appreciate if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We do have time for a couple of questions. Okay, Anuradha, I see you're up first. Go ahead. 
Oh, that was clapping. <laughs> Another hand up. All right, well, we'll wait for, for a hand or two. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting to see how dramatically the F mode frequency would change for the, uh, for the hot uh, neutron star versus the cold neutron star. But I, I didn't come away with a very clear picture of what time scale, like how long the, how long the, uh, the non-cold state of the neutron star would last and what the, the impact would be on gravitational wave signals and searches, like search strategies. I see. Uh, uh, do you refer to the proton neutron star case or the yeah? I was looking at the, the proton neutron star case, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So in this case, um, we only have uh, I, I can show this plot here. We only have uh, one second. That's the maximum time that we have uh, from the simulations. However, uh, the Kelvin Helmholtz phase for proton neutron stars can last from seconds to minutes, and if we found that the relations are recovered to within one second, then we can say for sure that they are valid with uh, more accuracy for later times. And um, the time scale here is around minutes. So we could use that uh, in this time scale. But after that, uh, if we cool down, if the proton neutron star cools down to become a neutron star, uh, we would then be considering the relations for the cold neutron stars. So this is um, so that's the time scale of the evolution of the of the F mode frequency, for instance. But what about how does that compare to damping times for for those modes under those conditions? I mean, are, I'm trying to get a handle on will the will these oscillations die away by then or not? Yeah, the the damping time uh, it decreases as time increases. So if we had the chance of detecting the the gravitational waves for an early post bounce time when the oscillations uh, have a kind of big damping time compared to the cold neutron star case, uh, then they would last longer, I believe. But for the F mode in particular, the damping times are reasonably small. I mean, they're reasonably large compared to other modes. But if we go back in time, this damping time increases even more. Yeah, okay, that's what I had missed. So that's really, that also is a dramatic difference uh, compared to the cold neutron star case. So, yeah, the, we have three orders of magnitude here. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, is there another question from the audience? All right, if not, thank you very much, Victor. And, and uh, let's yeah. thank uh, all of the speakers of this session and uh, good nights. And we will see you all online in other sessions.